Sergeants, can we please start the recordings? Computer recording started. Cloud recording is up. Backup is rolling. Sergeant Lugo with the opening, please. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committees on Criminal Justice, jointly with Women and Gender Equity. At this time, would all panelists please turn on your videos. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices to vibrate or silent. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chairs, we are ready to begin. Morning, everyone. Nice to see you. Thank you to all the staff here for getting us started and welcome to our hearing. I'm City Council Member Keith Powers, Chair of the Committee on Criminal Justice. I am joined today by Council Member Dharma Diaz, Chair of the Committee on Women and Gender Equity for today's joint oversight hearing on women's experiences in New York City jails. I also want to recognize Councilmember Rosenthal, who's here to us today and has been deeply and deeply engaged in these issues and a number of bills on them as well, and had chaired this uh, one of these committees as well. Um, and I'll recognize our other colleagues here momentarily. Um, the number of women involved in the criminal justice system nationwide has grown since 1970. The vast majority are women of color and their pathways into jails are different from those of men and so are their experiences navigating life inside of our jail system. The overwhelming majority of incarcerated women are jailed because of poverty, sexual and physical abuse, employment and substance abuse and mental health issues. In New York City jails, about 85% of incarcerated women have, sub, sub, have, have been identified as having substance abuse issues and two thirds who are suffering with mental health problems. The trauma of abuse, violence, and poverty that so many incarcerated women experience outside of jail is often relived while spending time inside of our jail system. Women in jail are more likely than men to experience sexual victimization while in custody. A 12, 2012 federal study found that the Rose M. Singer Center in Rikers Island had some of the highest rates of sexual victimization. About 9% of women at Rosie's report that a staff member or another incarcerated person sexually abused them. That's 9% compared to 3.2% nationally. Women in jail are also often mothers. About 80% of women at Rosie's have children. Just a short stay behind bars can significantly impair that mother and child relationship. And while visitation programs help those women sustain connection with their children, many still face challenges staying in touch and reuniting with their children upon release. And that is especially true right now when in-person visitation and in-person programming that support reunification have been suspended due to COVID-19. That's certainly something we're gonna be asking about today. Today, I look forward to hearing from the Department of Correction and uh, about ways in which its policies, practices, and programs support the needs of women in custody and how the women and how the council can be a partner in supporting and advocate advancing that work. We're going to hear several bills by Councilmember Rosenthal. Intro 1646 would require the Department of Correction to use an electronic case management system to track investigations of sexual abuse. Intro 1491 would require the Department of Correction to develop a comprehensive training program for investigating sexual crimes, an area that we believe is in need of significant reform. And finally, intro 1209 would permit pregnant women in Department of Correction custody to use a doula or midwife services while in the delivery room. With that said, I wanna thank the committee staff here for putting together this hearing. I also wanna thank all the council members here who are in attendance. Let me see if I can get to them. I see uh, council member Holding, council member Kalos, the public advocate, Jumani Williams, uh, and I guess council member Rosenthal, council member Lander, Councilmember Van Bramer, Councilmember Riley, and I, oh, Councilmember Amprey Samuel, Majority Leader Cumbo. Uh, and I'm sure I missed somebody, but I apologize and I will make sure I get to you if I missed you. Uh, with that being said, I'm going to hand it over to my co chair today, uh, Co Chair Dharma Diaz. Good morning. I'm trying to hold back tears. I'm just getting over COVID 
And, and I'm thinking about the women that are incarcerated and are in a much more difficult place than I am today. So as I move forward with my testimony, if I stop for water or for just a breath of fresh air, be patient with me because it was, it was dear to me to take part in today's hearing. My staff worked really hard on this and I didn't want to let them down. But again, please be patient with me because definitely my heart is in it and women and incarceration is dear to us all. Good morning. Thank you, Councilman Powers, for the conversation today and for allowing me to partnership with you. As I said, I am Councilwoman Darmay Diaz. I chair the, the gender and committee. Uh, I chair the committee on women and gender. I'd like to also thank everyone who's participating here today. As my colleague noted in his opening statement, incarcerated women face many distinct issues from male counterparts. Over the past several decades, there has been a significant shift in women's involvement within the criminal system nationally. This is an implementation of more ex expen extensive law enforcement efforts and stricter drug sentencing laws, as well as a positive, no, not a positive, as well as a post-conviction barriers to re-entry that uniquely affect women. It is an important part of the conversations about our community and country, and especially around policing and how we deal with conflict, equity, and equality in our system. Issues around women in jail in particular have not prominent enough to popular topics. And as my colleague Keith, point, Keith pointed out, the vast majority of women involved in the criminal justice system are women like me, women of color. I am proud to be co-chairing today's hearing to reopen the conversation, to work to shift the conversation and to consider how we better serve incarcerated women in city jails, locally, nationally, in our communities. We know that women make up about 7% of the population in our city jails, but they are some of the most vulnerable of incarcerated population. Thank you, Karen, who's sitting next to me and coaching me on. As discussed at the last hearing on this topic, 2015, nearly twice as many incarcerated women as men fall into the categories of seriously and persistently mental ill. Mental illness is huge for me. As a human service provider, I must share with you all, mental illness is a lot, the bigger issue than we understand. According to the Incarceration Association of New York, an estimated 90% of women in New York's prisons have experienced sexual physical violence in their lifetimes. Studies have shown that incarcerated women face poverty, poor nutrition, and limited access to preventive medical care. Um, appropriately handling reported acts of sexual victimization and how God plans to better protect the women populations are priority. But the issues we'll be hearing about today affect men and women and smaller approaches and policies efforts, both men and women and improvements will not only help the vulnerable populations but the system at large. Additionally, as a mother and a grandmother, I feel the need to echo again the large number of women in prison and mothers and many the primary caregivers of their children. Or others prior to incarceration, incarcerating women in particular often faces immense burdens on their children, families, and communities. While state law requires that children born by the mothers are in jails be housed within mothers during the first year with some expectations. I look forward to hearing how and when expectations apply and how we will, how else we are supporting families, particularly when in prison, visitations at Rosie's remain suspended. How, how so? I have a 16 month old grandson at home. And just to think of my daughter when I have not been able to be with him is devastating to me. We know that, we know that support like family contact and visitation rights have a significant effect on reducing recidivism. But this is also matters for children and communities, especially during COVID-19 pandemic. Before turning back to Chair Powers, I want to mention that we are speaking to incarcerated women today. I look forward to continued conversations about gender equity and criminal justice systems soon, specifically to the Committee on Women and Gender Equity. It is interesting, is interested in a potential follow up hearing regarding related to the now overdue 
TGNCBNBI Tax Force report. And once the report is released by the Board of Corrections to both focus on issues related to DGNC and BI people in custody and report recommendations, including related to how they've been impacted and by the implemented. And finally, I would like to thank my staff and committee staff for preparing today's hearing, especially Karen Trey, my chief of staff, Richard Lawrence, my deputy chief of staff, Brenda McKinley, committee legislative counsel, Chloe Rivera, the committee senior policy analyst, and Monique People, our financial analyst. Again, Thank you all for your patience with me this morning. I turn it back to Chair Powers. Thank you. And I think we're gonna turn it over now to Councilman Rosenthal for an opening statement followed by our public advocate, Tawani Williams. Great. Thank you uh, so much, Chair Powers. Good morning, I'm Council Member Helen Rosenthal. My pronouns are she and her. And I do wanna begin by thanking Chair Powers and Chair Diaz for this much needed hearing and for including three of my bills. Chair Diaz, you always bring your heart to these hearings and um, that's what we need to hear. I really appreciate you. Um, and I too am really looking forward to hearing from the public uh, about these bills in this situation. All of us here today know that there's vast room for improvement of, and in some cases, reasons to altogether dismantle aspects of our correctional system. My bills under discussion today seek to address two urgent issues, sexual abuse while in DOC custody and the shameful state of giving birth while in custody. Two of my bills address sexual abuse uh, while in custody. The first, intro 1491 mandates that DOC's commissioner develop a comprehensive training program to investigate sexual crimes. Similarly, 1646 requires the creation of an electronic case management system to track investigations of sexual abuse. While I know the Department of Corrections has been working on this case management system for a number of years, um, it's time to shine light on what the hurdles are and to implement something responsible uh, now. As been shown repeatedly, trainings and DOC officers for reporting on themselves will do little to improve conditions if they're not paired with independent oversight and disciplinary action. These are the kinds of important steps in addition to the legislation that we hope public testimony will touch on today. Finally, intro 1209 will bring doulas and midwives to the aid of pregnant people who are in DOC custody. People in DOC custody, regardless of the rules, still give birth in shackles a well-documented reality that should get, give everyone in this room pause. Ensuring the availability of doulas and midwives for pregnant people in custody is urgently needed and should be common practice, both inside and outside of jails. The presence of these healthcare providers is clearly shown to improve maternal health outcomes, especially for black and brown women. I'm proud that we're hearing this bill today. Thank you for joining us. And again, thank you, uh, Chairs Powers and Diaz. Thank you. And I think we're gonna hear now from our public advocate, Jamani Williams. Good morning, can everyone hear me? Thank you so much. Uh, as I mentioned, my name is Jemani Williams, public advocate for the city of New York. Just want to thank uh, Chair Powers uh, and Chair Diaz uh, and uh, Councilman Rosenthal uh, for the passion around this issue and leadership. Uh, many, if not all, structures and institutions have been built with the needs and experiences of uh, cisgendered men in mind. Uh, jails are no different. As a population of incarcerated women, including trans women, continues to grow, we as a city must challenge ourselves to ensure 
that humanity, safety, and particularly and particular needs are met. In the last quarter of fiscal year 2020, the number of women detained at DOC facilities was 155. That rose to 253 persons by the end of December that year. Deeply concerned about this increase, particularly during a pandemic, and urged the administration to ensure every resource available is used to limit the number of people uh, that are being incarcerated in the first place. The bills being heard today, all sponsored by Councilmember Rosenthal, seek to address the experiences of incarcerated women. Intro number 1656 will require a comprehensive training program for sex crime investigations and intro number 1491 will track the investigation of sexual abuse. In the last six months of 2020, seven trans women reported sexual abuse and harassment. Each of those stories reflect an experience trapped within jail walls. Each experience shows how the power dynamic in jails can be uneven. Of course, no one should abuse this power, but statistics show otherwise. Jails are unique in that staff and those incarcerated are the only witnesses. We know that underreporting of sexual assault and abuse is common due to fear and intimidation survivors may feel. We must create trusted processes, comprehensive training and proper investiga investigations in order to encourage women to come forward. I support these bills and suggest that the investigation training program incorporates social workers and trauma-informed counselors. The last bill, intro number 1209, will provide doula and midwife services for pregnant individuals in DOC custody. Support from doulas help reduce cesarean sections, which are often used for black mothers, even when unnecessary, and anesthesia use. Women assisted by doulas also report lower preterm births. Being pregnant in the DOC facility is a harrowing experience as seen with the latest settlement for black women who were shackled during pregnancy by police. These individuals are treated as prisoners first. Meanwhile, these individuals are expect, expected to negotiate with DOC for accommodations. I support intro number 1209 as the burden should not fall upon these individuals. Rather, DOC should offer these services for, uh, that recognize humanity without hesitation. We must also focus on people who identify as trans, non-binary, and or gender non-conforming in jail. Entering into the cycle of incarceration is dangerous and it is difficult to escape from it. In the second quarter of the fiscal year, the number of people who identify as trans, intersex, or non-binary were 39. The fourth quarter of fiscal year 2020 only reported for people who identified as trans, which was 21. The increase may stem from a change in definition. Anyone who is incarcerated can enter into the cycle of incarceration even after leaving jail, which is especially impactful for trans, gender, non-conforming, and non-binary people. This is particularly alarming during a time when we are seeing so many anti-trans bills introduced across the country at a rate never seen before. It is alarming during a time when at least 10 trans people have been killed so far this year. We must make sure in the face of oppression and violence that there are resources available for those in the TGNCB community. Take hormone examples, for example, uh, take hormone therapy, for example. Correctional Health Services offers hormone therapy for anyone who requests it. However, this policy is unclear. Is there appropriate access to it? Are individuals given information related to his access and availability when detained? How many individuals undergo th therapy, undergo hormone therapy? How many requests are there per quarter? These are some of the questions that should be answered and clarified. Moreover, DOC's special considerations unit raises concerns. In the second half of 2020, 18 applications requested to be transferred into this, I'm sorry, 18 applicants requested to be transferred into this area designated for TGNCB, TGNCNB people were rejected. The agency must offer an explanation for rejection, which is not always given. Rejection can mean a higher likelihood of sexual assault or physical violence for individuals. DOC must clarify why these applications are rejected because of the danger of not being appropriately housed. Finally, we must make sure of a plan to eliminate solitary confinement. Earlier this month, the governor signed the HALT solitary bill. It is the city's turn to end solitary confinement. The proposed rules from DOC do not appear to go far enough. There are serious issues with them that may that my office has raised at a recent BOC public hearing. Instead, we need to pass legislation to eliminate the practice and introduce plans to separate individuals without depending on isolation. It is the right option, especially two years after the death of Lelin Palanco. I appreciate today's discussion as it is difficult to escape from the cycle of incarceration. Women and people in the TGNCB community should have resources and opportunities to avoid incarceration. It's up to us to make sure of that. I really thank the chairs and the council member uh, for their work, allowing me to speak today and look forward to hearing today's testimony. 
Thank you, Mr. Public Advocate. Thank you for joining us today. And thank you, of course, Councilman Rosenthal as well. I'm going to um, uh, now turn it over to Community Council to go through just some procedural items before we start, and then we'll hear from our first panel. Thank you. I'm Agatha Mavropoulos, Counsel to the City Council's Committee on Criminal Justice. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify. When it is your turn to testify, you will receive a prompt to unmute. Please listen for your name to be called as I will periodically announce who the next panelists will be. We will first hear testimony from the Department of Correction, followed by a period of question and answer from the committee members to the administration. We will then hear testimony from members of the public. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. Committee members will be limited to five minutes, including responses. I will now administer the oath to all members of the administration. After I say the oath, please wait for me to call your name and respond one by one. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before these committees and to respond honestly to council members? Ann Penson. I do. Judy Beal. I do. Serena Townsend. I do. Ellen Rivera. I do. Dana Wax. I do. Dr. Colleen Bessel. Is Dr. Colleen Bessel here? Okay. Um, Dr. Zach Rosner. I think we're we don't hear anything coming from that room. One second. Dana Kaplan? I do. Okay. Sorry, just waiting to hear from the CHS room. Um, Jeanette Merrill? Here. Okay, I can hear you now. Um, sorry, just to repeat. Um, Dr. Colleen Vessel? Hello, I do. Dr. Zach Rosner? I do. And Jeanette Merrill? I do. Thank you. We will now proceed with testimony from Ann Plenson, Executive Director of Women's Initiative at the Department of Correction. Department of Correction, Director Penson, you may begin when ready. And I just before we start, I just want to recognize we've been joined also by Council Reginero, and I believe we're counting on the Council Rivera as well. But sorry about that. Go ahead. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Powers, Chair Diaz, and members of the Criminal Justice Committee and Committee on Women and Gender Equity. My name is Annie Penson, and I'm the Executive Director of Women's Initiatives at the Department of Correction. I'm joined today by Deputy Commissioner of Programming and Community Partnerships, Dr. Judy Beal, Deputy Commissioner of Investigation and Trials, Serena Townsend, and Deputy Warden in Charge, Ellen Rivera, who oversees operations at the Rose M. Singer Center, the department's female facility. I'm also pleased to be joined by our colleagues at NYC h, &H Correctional Health Services and the Mayor's Office for Criminal Justice, both of whom are important partners in the care of women in custody. The department recognizes that women involved in the justice system are often victims of trauma and have high rates of substance use and mental illness. Therefore, the department provides gender responsive care and programming to support the mothers, sisters, and daughters placed in our custody. I thank you for the opportunity to update the council on the department's efforts to support its female population and to comment on the three bills being considered at today's hearing. The number of women in custody have significantly declined in recent years. 
Whereas the population was almost 700 in April of 2016, today there are approximately 250 women in the department's care. Regardless of the number of women in custody, the department maintains a facility that provides a variety of programming, reentry, and healthcare services that are responsive to women's unique needs. Department counselors meet with each woman who come into custody to assess her individualized needs and challenges and create a targeted plan that includes both jail-based and community-based services and will support a successful reentry into the community. Programming and reentry services are tailored to women and incorporate gender responsive, trauma-informed practices, and also focus on strengthening family connections through visit assistance from women with children. In addition, the Rose M. Singer Center operates a clinic that provides a broad spectrum of women's health services, houses women in need of additional support in mental health and substance use in dedicated units and provides an array of life and vocational skills development. In an effort to further improve programmatic services in 2020, the department redesigned its program delivery model to take an individualized case management approach to the provision of programs and services for all persons in custody. As part of this process, incarcerated individuals meet one-on-one -on -one with a counselor and are referred to programming based on their unique needs, including services designed to support family relationships and address trauma. This new service delivery model will better connect individuals in custody with services that support their specific needs and better support them in successfully re-entering the community. In recent years, the department has implemented a series of initiatives to address the unique needs of women in DOC custody. These initiatives are designed to strengthen mother-child relationships, empower women, connect them with resources in the community, improve their visit experience, train staff on gender responsive practices, and ensure that DOC's policies are gender responsive. Notably, department created a nationally recognized off-island visit program that enabled mothers to visit their children at the Children's Museum of Manhattan, strengthening the mother-child bond and lessening the impact of incarceration on the family. Over the course of the pandemic, the department has afforded televisits for person in custody and worked with the Osborne Association and our children to continue to facilitate supportive family visitation. We are continuing to work with these partners to develop more interactive television opportunities between mother and children and to further support family connections during this unprecedented time. While some of these initiatives have been born out of the challenges presented by the pandemic, we will continue to find ways to improve programming and services for women in custody and carry the lessons learned during the past year and future programmatic plans. During the pandemic, the department has continued to work with its community partners to provide modified services, including dedicated discharge planning hotlines. These hotlines connect incarcerated women to discharge planning caseworkers, ensuring women maintain connections to services that will be available to them upon release, in the coming months, the department will also be collaborating with MOPJ to further assist women in custody with post-release planning and services. Although we have not yet been able to welcome our community providers back to our facilities, DOC programming staff have been providing direct programming services to people in custody since October, 2020, including individualized assessments and case management and counseling and on-unit programming in a socially distant manner. In addition, as a part of our commitment to address the unique needs of women in our care, we are working with a national expert to develop a staff training on gender responsive practices and trauma-informed care. We are also working with the expert to review existing policies and develop new ones to ensure that gender responsive approaches are reflective in our daily operations. Finally, the department takes the safety and welfare of women in custody seriously. Violent incidents and uses of force involving women in custody remains low, and the department works to provide staff with trauma-informed training to help staff maintain a supportive environment for the women in our care. In 2019, the Rose M. Singer Center passed a PREA compliance audit. The department's investigation division exceeds standards in that same unit, sorry, exceeded standards in that same audit and continue receiving ratings of substantial compliance from the Nunez Monitor for its investigations into allegations of sexual harassment and abuse. With respect to our pro proposed legislation, in introduction 1209, the department recognizes the support doulas bring to mothers during the birthing process. As such, the department supports this legislation 
but for the safety of all involved, would advise the doula needs to be subject and clear a standard security review prior to the mother's due date. We look forward to working with the council in further discussing this legislation. Introduction 1491. With regard to intro 1491, the department enthusiastically supports the provision of trauma-informed training and interview techniques for investigators who review sexual abuse and harassment allegations. The department currently mandates such training and agrees with the council that its provision is critical to investigators' success in investigating sensitive matters. Introduction 1646. With regard to intro 1646, the department agrees with council that a centralized case management system for sexual abuse cases would support the overall work of the investigations division. The department previously agreed to build such a system through a corrective action agreement with the Board of Correction. Since that time, the department has issued an RFP and is in the final phases of establishing a vendor to build and implement such a system. The Department of Correction is committed to meeting the needs of women in its care and appreciates the council's interest and attention to, off, to this often overlooked group. My colleagues and I are happy to answer your questions. Thank you. And CHS, you're here to answer questions, but not to testify. Is that correct? Uh, okay. We're available for keeping. Okay, thank you. I, I, there's a, a lot of questions here, and I, I definitely want to be able to hand over to some of the Council Rosenthal to answer, uh, ask questions about her bills here today. So I'm just going to go through uh, a few topics here, and then obviously Councilor Diaz as well. Um, I, I guess my my, 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 my kind of starting point question is just to ask the Department of Correction what they believe is the biggest challenge facing women inside of our New York City jails at this moment? That's a great question. Um, I believe that one of the biggest challenges at this time um, would be for women in custody who have children um, and being able to connect it to their children. Okay, so uh, saying connected to the children, is that? Yes. Got it. Um, so on this, like where the department right now, am I, is it correct, am I fair to say is you, using that as the sort of jumping off point I'll just go to talk about visitations? What, what is the, right now, as I understand it, um, uh, I, I was just there last week, there's still no visitations for individuals at Rikers Island. As we talk about women, we talk about mothers, and as I noted, a very high percentage of women are mothers who are at Rikers Island. You've noted that's your top priority. So what is the plan at department for the, for the department right now to resume visitations, you know, uh, for, for everyone, I suppose, but particularly for women at Rosie's? So um, that's a great question. Um, thank you, council member. So we are, we know how important children are to mothers' lives. Um, and to continue to foster mother-child bonds while women are incarceration, um, we're working on several different initiatives, including the Visiting and Family Assistance Program. Um, in conjunction with, the, with MOCJ, the Osborne Association, and our children, um, we offer the Visiting and Family Assistance Program, where women in custody, their children, and family members receive support before, during, and after their visits, currently their televisits. Um, and so we are also planning to launch in May um, interactive visits for mothers and their children, televisits. So during these visits, they will have an opportunity to do homework together, do arts and crafts activities together, read books together, and have a more engaging televisit experience. Um, in addition, we also developed with the National Institute of Correction a family engagement form to identify women who are mothers and identify what challenges they are having and how we can support those needs. I want to clarify, you don't have televisits right now for mothers and children? We have televisits right now for everyone, including mothers and children, yes. But so what is the announcement that you're saying right now that you're, I think- Yeah, so we, in working with Mock J, the Osborne Association, our children, we're going to be developing a more interactive televisit experience for mothers and their children. When do children get to go see their mothers in person at Rosie's? 
So we would love to be able to offer in-person visits. Um, we're working very closely with DOHMH at this time um, so that we will be able to uh, bring back in-person visits when it's safe to do so. Okay, and then beyond the beyond the um, uh, the issue, uh, uh, which is an important issue of you know keeping families connected, what what do you identify as the other top issues facing women inside of the correctional facilities in New York City right now? Um, we know that um, many women come in, women in general um, come into the criminal justice system um, very different, have very different pathways than men do. Um, they deal with substance abuse, they deal with uh, trauma. They deal with mental health and they're also mothers. Um, and so to, to be able to support them around their trauma um, and other challenges, um, in October, we began, our DOC counselors began conducting individualized assessments um, and program plans so that we could assess what their needs are and begin making referrals, working with them one-on-one -on -one and making sure that their needs are being met. Um, in addition, as contracted providers resume in-person services, uh, we'll be implementing a core program menu um, that's going to include trauma-focused groups um, that identify that uh, address topics such as trauma, um, substance abuse, um, parenting, um, and whatever other challenges they may be facing. Um, we are also collaborating with a national expert and the DOC Academy to develop a training on gender responsive practices, which all staff assigned to the World Zen Singer Center will be required to take. Um, and also to help incarcerated mothers um, overcome the potential trauma. Um, like I mentioned, we offer the visiting and assistance program for, for mothers and their children. Um, also, Knowing that LGBTQ individuals in custody experience trauma related to their identity, um, the DLC director of um, LGBTQ initiatives has implemented a series of programs to enable this population to seek uh, support to address their needs, including a dedicated hotline, uh, LGBTQ community resource guide, uh, prepaid cell phones upon release, and weekly community meetings in the special considerations unit. Can I just go back to visit? So thank you for that. And it's, mm -hmm. it's uh, important for us to hear what we think the agency's priorities are. One follow-up question, though, which is facilities in August of last year had resumed in-person visitation. Is there a reason the city jails and Department of Correction didn't pursue the same timeline? Good morning, council member. Um, I, yes, we're aware that state docs um, did a brief temporarily reopen um, visitation. The reality is that the, the state system and the city system have different um, advantages and disadvantages. The state system has a different space spatial layout than the city does, and the city certainly has more congestion than many of our upstate um, partner areas do. Um, the department felt that it was important to um, get the in-person visitation plan right that it was important to do it as to reopen when we were sure that all people and all staff uh, who work and live in the Department of Custody could be safe. So we were really confident in the plan that we've been uh, developing over the past year in close coordination with our partners uh, across the city and look forward to uh, restarting visitation as soon as, as soon as it's safe to do so. Okay, it would be helpful to know kind of what the, we'll, we'll follow up with you on this to kind of know what the criteria you're looking at in terms of um, being able to resume that uh, because the connection with the family I think is really important especially at Rosie's and especially with the uh, uh, women who are incarcerated here to for the children and for their families as well um, you know I want to go to an issue which I think is deserving of our attention here today and I don't think was really mentioned um, which is of course, Priya and sexual abuse, something we've done a hearing on in the past. Uh, you know, maybe the agency could start by giving us a, a, a overview of what they believe is their status and progress when it comes to eliminating and uh, eliminating uh, or, or addressing Priya uh, and sexual abuse and sexual harassment in our city jails. We, you know, can look at the numbers and see. We are not, you know, we have seen some dips in the middle of the pandemic, but I think we have seen an incline back to uh, higher than numbers in the past. Can you give us a status today 
uh, for this committee and for the Women's Committee as well on what the agency is doing to address PREA in light of where the numbers are today and you know, kind of ongoing concerns that have been stated about progress with the agency. Sure, good morning. Um, I can answer that question for you. And thank you for giving us an opportunity to give you an update on our PREA investigations. Um, I know the last time we spoke was probably in 2018 when we had um, somewhat of a backlog in our investigations for PREA allegations. And I'm happy to report that since October of 2019, we actually do not have that backlog anymore. Uh, and so we, we take every sexual abuse and sexual misconduct allegation extremely seriously in the Department of Correction. Um, anytime that there is an allegation of sexual abuse, we take immediate action. What does that look like? We refer immediately to the Department of Investigation to see if they want to investigate criminally these matters. We, um, we make sure to interview the alleged victim and separate the alleged victim from the alleged perpetrator immediately. We uh, afford the alleged victim mental health, ministerial, and victim services and conducted a preliminary investigation. All of that happens within the first 72 hours of the actual allegation itself. And so we've been able to maintain that level of compliance for years at this point. Um, we do refer cases that we substantiate if they are criminal in nature to the district attorney's offices for criminal prosecution. We also um, hold people accountable, whether it's a criminal act or a non-criminal act of sexual harassment, uh, we hold them accountable as well. Any case that we substantiate with our investigation, PREA investigators, we make sure to discipline. We have a zero tolerance policy here. If we do have a substantiation of sexual abuse, we seek that person, that individual's termination if it is a staff member, and we seek that incarcerated individual's prosecution if it is an incarcerated individual who is the alleged perpetrator. All of our investigations, Yes. Go ahead. No, keep going. Go ahead. Sure. All of our investigators are trained, highly trained. They not only go through our regular four-week training that we uh, provide in our investigation division, but they also uh, receive specialized training. They receive National Institute of Corrections training specifically called Conducting Confidential Investigations in a Confinement Setting. We have also received external trainings um, that are specifically focused on trauma-informed interviewing techniques. Uh, as of 2019, I made sure that all of our PREA investigators were so trained. We had at 72 investigators, uh, including all of our PREA investigators, trained in trauma-informed training at that time. Um, this training was vetted by DCJS in response to the Sex Crimes Victims Bill of Rights legislation. So it was approved and used by all New York City agencies as, uh, as a training. And so the investigators themselves who investigate these allegations are well-trained uh, and we are able to, at this point and for the last couple of years, maintain our PREA compliance with the timeliness and the quality of our investigations. Sure, but I mean, the investigations is one component of this. Not letting them happen is the major, the real component to that. But I will talk about investigations just for a, minute, a second since you brought it up. So how many investigators do you have right now on staff at the Department of Corrections to investigate PREA complaints? So our PREA unit is comprised of one director, one deputy director, nine supervisor investigators and captains, and 25 investigators. We also have a PREA division within our trials unit that handles the disciplinary portion, and that is comprised of one director and one uh, attorney. And of course, that's overseen by myself. Okay. And when we spoke in 2018, we did a hearing on this, and I believe it was 2018, uh, there was a massive backlog of, of uh, uh, cases that needed to be investigated which I think you have said has been cleared. And you had said that in 2018, you were you know, staffing and working to clear those cases. But if I recall, and I, my memory is, I'm doing this off memory, but I, I think if I recall, step one was clearing a backlog that had existed. And then 
at, up to that point in time and then playing catch up with the cases that or you know addressing the cases that were coming in at that time are you saying when you say clear backlog are you saying that you have no past cases right now in under investigation you're correct and very good memory uh we did have a two-step plan uh, the original backlog was approximately 1,200 cases, and that was in June of 2018. We cleared all of those cases in by February of 2019, which was our corrective action plan due date. Uh, there had been a secondary backlog, as you mentioned, that had accumulated while we were focusing on those 1,200 cases. That secondary backlog was 266 cases, and those have been cleared as of October 2019. And okay. so... Yeah. Can you give us the outcome of those 1,200 and 260 cases? Can you tell us, share with us, what were the for breakdown of outcomes for those cases? Because doing them is certainly important, and I have more questions about it. But, you know, knowing sort of how these cases were resolved would be, would be helpful. Absolutely. So I don't have exact numbers. I can get that to you of these particular cases. Um, I do want to mention that we were audited and those cases were involved in looking uh, that the auditor looked at when they audited our investigations and we had exceeded standards with respect to the quality of our investigations. So I do appreciate that there is a concern that, you know, the backlog needed to be addressed, but it shouldn't just be addressed uh, by numbers. It needs to be quality investigations and we maintain that level of quality. We have been audited by uh, an external auditor. We also have the federal monitor who looks over our, uh, some of our PREA investigations and we have been in substantial compliance um, from the federal monitor on our PREA investigations that they have overseen. So there is a lot of oversight that occurs externally in an unbiased fashion um, to check and see if our investigators are doing a good job, frankly. And we have routinely and for years been deemed as exceeding standards or insubstantial compliance. Uh, but I can get you those exact numbers offline. That's no problem. And what is the average duration? Thank, thank, thank you for getting us the data. What is the average duration of an investigation? Pre investigations do not exceed 90 days. Okay. Although you had been in the past. In the past, but we have fixed the problem. And you are saying that 100% of cases today are, with, are being resolved, are being investigated within 100 days, I mean, sorry, 90 days. So I have a caveat to that because if the investigation is being looked at externally for criminal charges, either by the uh, Department of Investigation or by um, a district attorney's office, then that sometimes does take a little bit longer, understandably. So those cases do linger. What I can tell you is our current open caseload is only 101 cases. And the cases um, that we have are, um, we have 61 cases that are open from 2021. We have 27 cases that are open from 2020. And we have uh, a smattering of 2019 cases that are open that are just open because they are being criminally investigated and or prosecuted. All right, so 2019 cases are being criminally investigated. 2020, just 27 cases you said? That is correct. Those are all being criminally investigated. I there there I would say that about half of them are being criminally prosecuted, and the other half are only open currently because we had to do a little bit more of an extensive uh, investigation on them that required further interviewing. But the vast majority are uh, under the vast vast majority of the open 104 cases are under 90 days. But I, so I'm now confused. So 2020, you would agree with me, right? That it would be impossible to do 90 day review and have a case still open from 2020, right? That's impossible. It's, it's April 27th. So Correct. how do you have, say you're in full compliance when you now are telling us that you have 2020 cases that are still open and they're not all criminally investigated? I'm telling, I did not say full compliance. I say pre investigations have to be investigated within 90 days. We are in substantial compliance. Well, well you did say there's no backlog, right? So that would, wouldn't that consist of being a backlog? If there's about 10 or so cases that are still open somewhat past 90 days, then, then if we can deem that a backlog, we can deem that a backlog. But um, those are cases that the traditional, in the traditional sense of the word backlog, it's cases that have not been attended to. 
And that's just not accurate. We have investigated them. They require a little bit more of a little bit more work because they might be a little bit more extensive and require some more interviews, but they have all been uh, investigated within 90 days. They have to be closed expeditiously, which they will be, aside from the ones that are being um, investigated externally. I'm not, I'm not, um, um, I'm not, you know, picking on you for trying to represent the decay. I'm just saying that I think in my experience here now, like it just takes six or seven questions sometimes to really get the full picture of data. And we, and, you know, we can decide all independently success or not success. I'm very glad, clear, the, the, happy the backlog is cleared, you know, the 1200 cases and so forth. I just try to get an accurate picture of where we are. Sure. And, investigation and resources. Um, how, how, what percentage of cases have been referred out to the D? And by, I, just to clear, like, I feel this is the most pressing issue facing women in jail, as you can tell. So I'm asking a lot of questions on it, but we'll get to others as well. But um, how many percentage of cases are getting referred out to the DA or the DOI? Every single case that comes through that is a sexual assault or sexual abuse allegation gets referred to the Department of Investigation immediately. But then if they send it back to you, or if they, some of them say they send it back to you, how many are staying with the DOI to be investigated and how many have been referred out to the DA to, for criminal investigation? Okay. In 2019, there were 22 cases referred to the district attorney's office. In 2020, there were 13 cases referred to a district attorney's office. And so far in 2021, there have been two cases referred to a district attorney's office. Okay. Thank you. Um, the um, you you are working extensively in this area. You are viewing these cases, these investigations. As I said earlier, the investigations is an important way to have accountability and to provide clarity into what's happening. But the the number of uh, is still is still concerning to us. Having being somebody who is investigating these and working with a team that's investigates every day. What recommendations do you have for the Department of Corrections yourself to help address what are, I think, or what recommendations or what steps, I guess, is the DOC taking here to address, to, to address PREA, not from the sort of a closed closing investigation standpoint, but from prevention and preventing it happening. I think that's investigation is a component to that, but it's certainly not the price, it should not be the only and prime component to that. So I think what we would like to hear are the steps that the department is taking right now to address another increase uh, here uh, when it comes to pre uh, allegations. I think it's a fair question uh, that maybe even more than one person could answer, to be honest. Um, I think that um, a focus on inmate services or incarcerated person services is important, making sure that we, uh, some, sometimes it's just about going back to the basics, care, uh, uh, care for the incarcerated person, um, making sure that they receive their mandated services and um, cooperation essentially with the investigation, which we have seen, we have seen cooperation, um, making sure that if there is an alleged uh, perpetrator that they are separated, immediately from the alleged victim, which is what we make sure happens. We also make sure to hold staff accountable. Like I said, we have a zero tolerance policy with respect to substantiated cases of this nature. And there's nothing more in my mind, um, I guess, influential than if somebody does something wrong and is then held accountable because then their colleagues can see that they are being held accountable and their colleagues will take a beat before doing uh, something similar in the future. And so, you know, I think accountability is obviously important. Um, I think making sure that mandated services are given is important and just paying attention to what's going on, just having your eyes on, on what's going on in the jails. It's important because what we do see is more often than not, the substantiations are coming um, from allegations between incarcerated persons rather than a staff member committing the act of misconduct. Most of our 
Um, most of our substantiated cases involved incarcerated persons um, doing the misconduct. And so that is something that I think is important. Just, just making sure that incarcerated individuals are treating each other the right way. Uh, because like I said, that's where most of our cases are coming. And to, yeah, good. Sorry, so to DC Townsend's point um, regarding basics being, being critically important to the sexual safety conversation, um, sexual safety really does begin at intake. Um, upon intake, all persons who enter custody are uh, screened for a variety of classification concerns, including uh, whether or not they were previously a victim of sexual victimization, including whether or not they were previously um, convicted of a sexual abuse allegation. And the department works to ensure that people who are previous, who are known sexual victims or known sexual abusers are, are housed in separate areas of a housing unit or housed in separate housing units um, and are certainly known to the department. Um, I'm sure Deb Rivera also can provide yes. a little more information about pre or rounding that happens and as well as the classification tool. Yes. So uh, good morning. So as far as what was mentioned with the, if an individual has identified or has uh, informed staff that they were a victim of sexual abuse, or if they were convicted for a sexual offense, we would not house an individual, an SA with a SV, um, a sexual abuser with somebody who um, is a victim of sexual assault. Uh, those individuals would be separated. In addition, the supervisors are tasked with conducting pre-announced tours and documenting those tours in the logbook. Staff is also reminded to conduct their tours um, of the housing areas, um, make a tour and to ensure that uh, nothing inappropriate is occurring. And if they are informed of any sexual assault or allegation, they are to immediately inform their supervisor and those individuals are separated and afforded medical and mental health services and PREA is immediately notified. Okay, I want to ask CHS just for a question, uh, just for a second. Can CHS, can you talk to us about your role whenever an allegation of sexual abuse or harassment is made at a city jail, what that process is? And, and then... Hi, good morning. Um, so I'm Dr. Colleen Vessel. I'm the site medical director of the Rosen Singer Center. Um, thanks so much for having me um, come here today. I'm getting into this work as a matter of health equity and social justice for, for me and many people at CHS. So I'm very happy to speak today about you know, the work they're able to do on behalf of our patients. Um, when, when we do have patients that, that we learn of that have made a, um, a sexual allegation or a pre op complaint, um, our usual, well, we, as clinicians, we are mandated reporters. So our first role is to see the patient, you know, get more information you know, from there in their own words what, you know, what occurred. And um, from there, we uh, report uh, report the um, report the issue to our operations department, who then um, essentially who, who keeps track of the, of the complaints. We also see the patient clinically, determine examine them, determine if they need to be connected to further me uh, medical services uh, in the uh, in the ER, for example, to have a, a forensic exam if that's appropriate. We also then connect them to mental health services and to our sexual abuse and advocacy program, which um, follows up with the patients afterwards to to meet their needs. Okay. And, um, I, you know, I, I have like a whole set of questions, but I know that there's a bunch of people behind me. So I, I'm going to come back. I got some more pre questions and some things about Rosie's and things like that, that I want to get to, but I do want to actually just use an option. Thank you for that answer, but I'm going to, I'm going to come back. Uh, I want to make sure I get to chair Diaz, council Rosenthal and others as well. And then I'm going to come back with some more questions, uh, from there, but I want to be respectful of his time here. Okay. Um, so I'll hand it over to chair Diaz and then I think we'll go to members as well. Thank you. I, I'd like to begin with asking all of you that are reporting to be real sensitive when you speak to numbers. As someone that has been a victim of domestic violence and has spent my career in advocating for individuals, it's somewhat offensive to me when we describe a situation, uh, our data as under 10 or 10 or so. At the end of the day, we're social service providers and it's our business to assure that each case is solved favorably. You know, I'm here looking at, at Dr. Victoria Phillips' um, reports and actually and it's, 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 I'm saddened, I'm pissed and I'm annoyed that we have someone who probably has more accurate data than was being reported to us. 
One case too many is too many. Let's not forget that lives are being impacted. And that's the bottom line. Being incarcerated has to be amongst the most difficult challenges an individual can face. Separate and apart from being a woman who's the lesser, who is not as strong, I would say, physically, and to think that women are being, anyone is being sexually abused, and we have a system that's callous, that says it's numbers, we have issues with data. To me, data means the world. If it's an issue of you're understaffed, and that's why you cannot get the data done, talk to us as a council. That is help you, help us help you. For looking that we're looking for answers for 2019, I'm looking at messages here from 2015, that's not okay. Not everyone that's incarcerated is a bad person. And it also doesn't mean because you've been incarcerated, you can't make it out and be productive. So for those of you that are in the comfort of this beautiful desk that I'm looking at, go, we think of that. It's your duty to serve our people. I have two dear friends. One spent 17 years incarcerated and the other one 16 years. And you would never believe the transformation that these two women did with their lives. One of them had a child while incarcerated. Unfortunately, I was not able to get her to come in today and testify. But today she is running a nonprofit and serving women in need. The, my other good friend works with people coming out of incarceration that have suffered injustices and addicted. Turning these individuals into mentors and leaders of tomorrow. That's what it's about. No one should be shackled. This is 2021. Let's get it right and get it real. And anyone that's incarcerated and dealing with COVID or the after effects of COVID, it's real. Those of us that have survived it have to fight harder. So again, those of you that are overseeing and monitoring individuals with special conditions, let's keep it real. Let's keep it sanitized and understand that when you're reporting to us, one life is one too many. I'm going to go on to ask you, because I, I know that my, my colleague asked wonderful questions, some that I would have asked myself, and I, I didn't get um, a total satisfaction with the answers. So if I'm repeating his question, it's only because what you delivered to me did not meet my, my needs. I'd like to go back into your process of when you identify that a staffer has indeed violated someone that's incarcerated his rights. It's, is there, after 90 days, you know, we, what's, what's your true process when someone, when there's an allegation against someone, and if there is an allegation does not lead to termination, what is done? Is there sensitivity training? What are we doing to ensure that if this individual had a sliver of possible negative behavior that we're addressing it. Can someone answer that first question for me? I'll handle that question. Um, first, I would like to say that I have actually dedicated my entire life to seeking justice for people who have been victimized. You may not know that about me, but that is who I am. I Thank spent you. 10 Thank years at the Kings County District Attorney's Office prosecuting crime and with a specialization on sex crimes prosecutions. So I have spent my life in the courtroom advocating for victims. So thank you for letting me address, address that first. Thank you. Secondly, you're welcome. Thank you. And so speaking of the allegations, I want to make something very clear because when we get an allegation, um, it doesn't mean that somebody has indeed done what has been alleged. And so we have to look at that. However, the simple fact of the allegation causes us to respond immediately even if it doesn't end up substantiated. And so what we do immediately is separate the alleged victim from the alleged perpetrator, immediately. And that separation order stays in effect. We also immediately send the allegation, if it is one alleging a criminal act, to the Department of Investigation to see if they want to take it over to investigate it for a criminal um, prosecution. If they decide not to, they refer it back to us for administrative handling. 
that's the, that's any allegation against the staff member. If there's an allegation uh, by an incar incarcerated person against another incarcerated person, those two people are also separated immediately. Um, and if there is any inclination whatsoever from us in those early hours that this will be a substantiated case, we refer that to a district attorney immediately because that is the body um, that has to handle the criminal prosecution if, if it does amount to that. And so all of these steps are taken very, very quickly. And so I don't want any, you know, I, and it could be my fault, maybe I misspoke. I don't want there to be any misconception out there that we're taking 90 days or that we wait 90 days or anything of that nature. Uh, because you're right, it is a very sensitive issue. And if something did happen, it needs to be addressed immediately. And I wanna assure you and everybody that if we do substantiate something like that, we do have a no zero tolerance policy. And even if it doesn't rise to the level of criminality, we will take it all the way. We cannot, unfortunately, because of you know, due process laws, we can't terminate somebody unilaterally. Uh, if it's a staff member, for example, we, we have to go through the process. The process uh, involves going to the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings, oh, seeking that termination. I wanna say we actually did, you know, we don't have that many cases to be fair, where things are substantiated to that level. But when we do, we go all the way. And I'll give you an example. Back in 2018, we did have a, a case of that nature. Um, and we took that person to trial because we wanted to terminate that person. Throughout the whole waiting period, that person was modified without any inmate contact, of course. Um, we took them to trial and won. However, oath uh, in their uh, recommendation did not terminate. They wanted to remove days from that person. We did not think that was enough of a penalty. Uh, and there is an option for our commissioner to override that recommendation, which she did. And we terminated that person. And so I use that as an example of how seriously we take this. Uh, we, we absolutely do. And, and so I don't want to leave this hearing with any sort of uh, misconception on that front. So thank you for allowing me to address that. No, I, I, I thank you for your detail. Sure. It warms the heart to know um, that you're on it. Sure, I, thank, thank you. you. I, I'd like to, uh, to ask some questions in reference to, to visitors and, and your process. My understanding is that there's been some issues with technology. How, how are, we, are we dealing with, with that? Can you give me a report on how you've been able to improve the conditions within the last 30 days, if not, if not 60 days? Sure, council members. So I, um, I have also heard these concerns about technology. I do want to flag that the Board of Correction did an audit of, um, of grievances submitted related to technology. Um, and if looking at the total number of visits, which uh, at this point of televisits, which is over 40,000 since we started, um, which, since we stood up this process in uh, April of last year. And I also want to stress that we did not have a televisit process before COVID hit. Uh, this department created a televisit process in two weeks and began finding ways to connect people with their loved ones during this difficult time. So of the approximate 40,000 visits that have occurred, I believe that there were uh, um, under 450 complaints related to technology. Now, I understand that every single one of those people um, you know, certainly experienced an issue and it kept, may have kept them from their visit. I also understand that um, the number of grievances received is not necessarily the number of issues experienced, but it is roughly one or two percent of visitors, um, even accounting for the fact that that is not the full number of people who experience technological issue, who experienced some, some issue. Um, in order to better support visitors, um, in the last uh, 30 to 60 days we around this issue, we have revamped our form. So in fact, when you hit submit to submit your visitor request form, it more clearly explains to you how, the, how you will be contacted by the department and when you'll hear about your visit. Um, I also, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but our visit staff actually call all people who have scheduled televisits and make sure to walk them through the process so they understand they should check their camera, they should check you know, their phone so that they can have a successful visit. Thank you for going the extra mile on that. Thank you. Okay. 
Now, I, I like to go on to ask more questions around children and, you know, priority. I have two questions in reference to visiting. One is children. When a child wants to visit, does that go to a, a priority list? That's one question. And how are we dealing with individuals that are wheelchair bound? Sure. So there are also some challenges to wheelchair bound individuals. So in pre-COVID times, I, I believe, and uh, Annie uh, will be able to provide a, additional information on this, I believe that there were specific uh, days or times that would, um, where we would prioritize visits for children. Um, with the televisiting process, that is more difficult because it's, it's also based on our internal scheduling system, the days that the family is available, and the days that they're requesting for a visit. Um, so it's a little more complicated, but I also believe that families can schedule through the, the Family Visitor Assistance Program. Um, they can receive support around scheduling their visits with the family, the Visiting Family Assistance Program if they're having challenges scheduling their televisits, yes. Um, and regarding in-person visitation and uh, wheelchair-bound individuals, we do make every effort to make sure that people with any kind of disability are able to access the facilities. I believe we have visitor route buses that are um, wheelchair accessible, um, or if, if one of those buses is not immediately available, we'll work to ensure that one of our uh, fleet vehicles that is wheelchair accessible um, can support the person um, and, and bring them from the visit house to the specific facility. Um, I can certainly, I off the top of, of my head at this moment, I don't have um, any more information on how we support people with who are in a wheelchair, but I can absolutely get back to you um, after the hearing. Thank you. I just have two more, two more questions. I'd like to go back to victims and how do we deal with um, the aftercare once they've gone through the process and you validate it that what they reported has been legitimate. So I, you know, I can leave that to my colleagues, but I will tell you at least for our purposes in the investigation division, if and when something like that does happen, we are with them the entire way. So for example, uh, I mentioned that we had two cases that we substantiated that we sent over to the district attorney's office for prosecution. So what we do is we do everything that we can to make these individuals comfortable throughout that process. I know as a former prosecutor that it is very difficult to come forward and especially to speak with prosecutors with the intention of potentially getting on a stand and testifying. And so what we do on our end is our investigators will help even with transporting, uh, we won't do the transport, but we will help facilitate and make sure that the individual, if they do need to go to, let's say, see a prosecutor to tell what happened, that they are in the right hands and that they are helped through that process. Um, and I'm sure, I can't speak for my colleagues at the district attorney's office, but I know that they always um, have advocates present over there as well. Um, and so uh, we, we do everything that we can throughout that process to, to give support and lend support to the alleged victim. The department also has um, sexual support, sexual assault support hotlines. We uh, partner with um, Safe Horizon to provide a dedicated hotline. Um, I believe there's also a uh, sexual assault support hotline through CHS, and perhaps CHS can speak to their support. How does one access the support hotline? Meaning, I dorm as it's two o'clock in the afternoon and I feel need to speak mm -hmm. out reach out to, to my counselor. Is that something that I could just have conversation and, and request it? That's so during all um, time where people have, uh, during all out of cell time, which in general population is 14 hours a day, um, people have access to uh, telephones during that entire time. The sexual assault support hotline is posted throughout the facility. Um, and I believe um, PREA coordinators will also provide a pamphlet to individuals um, and meeting with them so that they have the information um, of how to how to access both the, the Safe Horizon hotline and the uh, CHF hotline. Thank you. I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues and I'll go for a second round of questions once my, my colleagues have presented their questions. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Oh, great. 
Okay. So I will now call on council members in the order they have used the Zoom raise hand function. If you would like to ask a question and you have not yet used the Zoom raise hand function, please do so now. Council members, please keep your questions to five minutes. The Sergeant at Arms will keep a timer and will let you know when your time is up. Uh, you should begin once I have called on you and the Sergeant has announced that you may begin. First, we'll hear from Council Member Holden, followed by Council Member Rosenthal. Time begins. Uh, thank you, everyone. I'm sorry I had to jump off to another hearing, but um, uh, what percentage of detainees have been vaccinated? Hi, good morning. Um, so as of right now, we're just under 50% of women have been vaccinated. So just uh, under 50%. Um, yes, of women. Of women, yeah. Yes. Uh, now, does uh, is that... Um, why only 50%? Is that because it wasn't available, the vaccines? Or, no, actually, or I mean, the, I would say, can, oh, I'm sorry, sorry, go ahead. Or some of the detainees just refused to take it, to get it. Well, so I would say actually compared to the community, I think we're doing pretty well, even above, you know, the community vaccination rates. Um, we've actually, um, CHS pretty early advocated with the state to be able to vaccinate um, patients who otherwise would meet state criteria. As I'm sure you're aware, initially, people in custody were left out of the high risk group. Um, but through being able to vaccinate people in accordance with state guidelines, we were able to start pretty early. So we started in January vaccinating our highest risk um, patients. And as the state criteria opened up, we continued to vaccinate from there. Um, so at this point, we've actually, as I mentioned, reached about half of women. We have done a lot of outreach efforts, which just includes reducing barriers to getting vaccinated. So we've gone to the housing area to provide education. Additionally, even vaccinating in the housing areas if they're open to it. We've opened up a sick call line where people can call and say that they would like to get vaccinated and we'll put them on the schedule. Um, we've set up kind of a, like a pseudo mass vaccination site once a week where we can call as many people down as who want them to come to get vaccinated. And for every person that was in custody, um, we've actually, I've actually scheduled a one-on-one -on -one appointment to be able to discuss um, the pros and cons of vaccination um, with a provider. And so all those things together have um, led to actually the highest vaccination rate of any building on the island. All right, just um, when was the last time family members or especially children were, were allowed to visit their, their mothers? This, so visitation has been paused since um, mid-March 2020, um, but we stood up, as I mentioned, the televisit system um, by early April 2020. Um, so family members have continued to visit their, their incarcerated loved ones through that system. So I'm sorry, I missed that. I couldn't hear. You sure. So um, televisit or sorry, in-person visitation was paused in March, mid-March 2020, in line with uh, you know the height of the COVID pan COVID-19 yeah, pandemic. Yeah, I got that part, but I just missed that little second part you said. Oh, that we so as I as I mentioned, within about two weeks, we stood up a televisit system as I as I described. And so family members and children have continued to be able to visit their incarcerated loved ones through the television. So, so what's the plan now to have uh, in-person visits? When, when is that going to happen? I don't have a definitive date to share with you today, but we're working very closely with our health partners um, and city partners across the city and have been spending the past year setting up and getting ready for a safe return to in-person visitation. So, you know, we are unfortunately still in the pandemic, but are carefully looking at citywide uh, markers and look forward to bringing back in-person visitation uh, as soon as it's safe to do so, which we anticipate, which we hope will be, you know, in the near future. I, you know, I think there's got to be a bit, some more urgency to that because nursing homes have opened up and that's a, even a higher risk population, yet our jails haven't. Um, there, there seems to be, you know, if you haven't seen your mother or held your child's hand for over a year, that's, and, and there's no plan to reopen yet. I mean, you should have opened up a month ago, if, especially if the, the person's been vaccinated. And, and that's a way to get more uh, detainees vaccinated by saying, if you get vaccinated, um, we can, we can have, uh, start family visits. So that's a way to urge uh, some of the detainees, possibly, I'm not saying you have to, but I think that's one way. But I think at this point, if you have, if you have almost 50% of the uh, detainees vaccinated, allow them to see their families and do it right now. No, yes. 
Yeah, sir, I, I appreciate, I really do appreciate your thoughts on this. And we um, agree that it is important to bring back family visitation as soon as it's safe to do so. As I, as I stated this- no, when, you say, when you say that, that um, nursing homes are a higher risk for infection of, uh, of the virus than jails, so I am not a public health expert, so I, I can't. I, I would say that. that I would say with with the with the stats, it is, uh, and yet the state allowed um, the nursing homes to have visits. I visited my mom over a month ago, who I haven't seen, you know uh, held her hand in over a year, but I, they allowed me a month ago to visit, um, and I think the children whose mothers are incarcerated should have you know, the same right to do that and, this, and, and be allowed to do that. So I wouldn't hesitate any longer. What's holding things up? The pandemic? Yes, the pandemic, but other institutions have opened up. The jail should open up. And it could even be, you know, I mean, if you have to, especially if they were vaccinated, but you can have a partition. But all right, thank you. Thank you, chairs. Next, we'll hear from Council Member Rosenthal. Thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate it. Really appreciate the questions um, from my colleagues. Um, I have a number of questions, but I, I just want to uh, say to people, I am watching the um, a race board that Dr. Victoria Phillips is putting up in the screen, and it's incredibly helpful. Um, if she would like to reach out to me directly now, my email address is helen at helenrosenthal.com. I'd uh, like very much to, to be talking to her. So I'd appreciate that if she could include her cell number. Um, so uh, I, we've been talking a lot and I've heard um, the, uh, I've heard you talk about a very, um, serious uh, policy around sexual abuse and uh, you know a no no zero tolerance policy um, and and you know the proof is always in the pudding on that um, so I'm just wondering in the last um, number of years you can pick the number one year two year five years um, how, how many cases against a DOC officer for sexual um, abuse, assault have been substantiated? Um, so thank you for your question. Most of our substantiations are against incarcerated persons uh, who have sexually assaulted or abused other incarcerated persons. Uh, we have had a couple of sex abuse or actually sexual misconduct cases against staff members. Um, I will tell you that even when we substantiate a case uh, against an incarcerated person, if there was staff misconduct involved, we take that seriously too. Meaning, was the staff not paying enough attention and that's what allowed this to happen. So I'll give you an example. We actually just uh, as I mentioned, in order to terminate somebody, we have a lengthy process that we have you to know, go through. With all due respect, I, I really heard all of this. I really did. And I'm on a clock. So if you could just start, I, I, and I appreciate the color. I really do, the, the details. But let's start with the first question, just a number. How many DOC officers have had substantiated cases for abuse, misconduct, assault, you tell me the character, the categories, but just numbers. Let's start with that and then we'll get into the color of it. Sure, I don't wanna misspeak. I wanna get you the accurate number that you're looking for. I can get it for you. I mean, so this I don't hearing is about very this number. issue. <laughs> so I would imagine you either have the answers at your hands right now, but given that this is the topic of the hearing, I'm, I'm happy to circle back in 10 minutes and perhaps someone on your staff can get the answers to these questions. So, so let's, let's just start with numbers and then I promise you sure. we're gonna get into detail. Okay, I can tell you that in 2019, 
Um, we substantiated two cases against staff for sexual misconduct. That was meaning not sexual harassment, because I think you're asking about sexual abuse at this point. Um, in 2020, we had zero, and in 2021, thus far, we have zero. And what happened in the two cases against the officers? Unfortunately, because it's still pending, I cannot speak to the details. So in 2019, I guess two years ago, and I guess I don't know when the case happened. It was substantiated in 2019. So, so I don't know when the alleged abuse happened within the prior year, within the prior two years, do you know? Um, it's referring to, an in, to incidents that occurred in 2019. Okay, yes. uh, they were substantiated. And now two years later, we don't know what's happening with those officers. Since the cases were substantiated, have they been put on modified duty? Yes, ma'am. And, no and what contact. is that duty? It is a no inmate contact post that they would be put on. Yeah, so those two individuals have been put on no inmate contact posts. Yes. Okay. And how many cases during that same period of time were um, unsubstantiated? Not unfounded, but unsubstantiated. Uh, just one moment, I should have that. Mm -hmm. You know what, I don't have it in front of me at this time. I can get you that information. I know we're on a clock. I can get it to you. By the the vast majority are unsubstantiated um, and or unfounded. Yeah, I noticed that. And that's exactly what I wanna ask about. What, what do you think's going on there? I mean, look, I, I know I, I'm sitting and asking from a privileged position. I don't go into Rikers every day. I don't work there. I'm not an inmate, so I, I appreciate that. And I, I, I'm asking this question with all, seriously all due respect. But what do you think about the fact that, I mean, the numbers around 500 or more are unsubstantiated or unfounded? What, what are your thoughts about that? Well, the cases that are unfounded are cases that we are able to actually prove but with concrete evidence that they, uh, that they did not happen. Uh, cases that are unsubstantiated, technically that means that there's not enough evidence to prove that it did happen by preponderance of evidence. What yeah. do I think? Uh, we do, you know, there are situations where we have um, reporting concerns uh, with, with individuals. We have, for example, um, just in the last, period that we collected data on the last six months of 2020, just five inmates were responsible for reporting 36% of the department staff on incarcerated person allegations. And a total of 10 inmates, if you take the, the next five and include the 10, were responsible for reporting 45% uh, of the allegations. And so we do have um, sometimes situations where um, in, in individuals may be reporting and, it, and reporting over and over and over and over again. And we of course have to take every single one of those allegations seriously, which we do. And we respond to every single one of those allegations uh, like I had described earlier, immediately separating. You think for those allegations, um, would it be possible for those individuals to be connected with um, someone at Safe Horizon? Yes. An advocate who can help them think through what's going on? Yes, yes. And are they? So when they, when we go down to do our investigation initially, we make sure that we do give them 
the Hope for Healing pamphlet, mental health, ministerial services, things of that nature. Um, that, that does include the phone number to Save Horizon. And are and they so given any privacy when they make those calls? I would have to defer to my colleagues on that. I will tell you that they are given privacy when, we're, when we interview them. We make sure to do so in a confidential setting. No, no. We are they given privacy that. when they reach out to Safe Horizons or another advocate? So we would have to um, we'd have we have to look into that and we'll get back to you, council member. Um, the phones are generally uh, in a more open area of the housing unit, um, but I can't speak to any sort of individual um, case where somebody may request an opportunity to have a little more privacy. Uh, but we can certainly uh, speak and. and talk to some of the program counselors at RMSC and get back to you. So someone's making an allegation that is an incredibly intense, traumatic allegation. I mean, you heard the, the passion in Chair Diaz's voice. And you're, you're saying that in order for that person to handle that trauma, they're not given any privacy to talk to a therapist or they're, they're not given any space to figure out how to handle it um, with an advocate. I mean, this is some pretty basic stuff that we talk about all the time um, with DV or, or sexual assault, sexual abuse uh, with the NYPD, just the absolute critical importance of putting folks in touch with somebody who knows how to, uh, you know, speak with someone in a, in a meaningful way. So, so there's, I mean, let's just set the stage. There's no, no opportunity for that. And, and that's okay. That's the answer. Then maybe we need to make that happen, but I just want to know what the answer is. If I may, I'm sorry. Uh Good morning. And if I'm understanding your correct your question correctly, if uh, an individual, if a woman is asking uh, to speak to someone in a private manner in regards to this serious type of allegation, we do afford them the opportunity to speak to somebody in social services in order for them to speak to a counselor and give them that opportunity to be in a safe private space. So that so, is a point. But I'm asking about an advocate at Safe Horizon, right? So this is a thoroughly vetted nonprofit that you all have contracts with. Yes. I'm, I'm wondering, so if somebody uh, could could speak with them. Even if the, uh, regard, uh, the request was made to speak to somebody at Safe Horizon, we would make sure that the individual is given the uh, opportunity to do so in a private area. Oh, so you're okay. saying that everyone who makes an allegation, they get the material from you and then they can say, I would like to speak with an advocate. They do have I'm that so opportunity. Curious, how many people who make allegations take you up on that offer? I don't have those numbers. Does anyone? No, does anyone take you up on the offer? Has, um, has anyone seen um, anyone have a private conversation, be given the opportunity to have a private conversation with an advocate? Oh, excuse me, this is Dr. Vessel. May I step in for a moment? Please. Hi. Um, so I, I can't speak to Safe Horizon, but I can say that we do get a fair amount of our referrals um, from mental health. Um, so patients might not call on the phone or speak with, um, or speak with an outside agency. But I would say it's fairly common for a patient to speak with their mental health provider and disclose it to them, and then they'll share it with us. Yeah, I'm not talking about a mental health provider. I'm talking yeah. about an advocate at Safe Horizons. And I'm really sorry, apples this, this and is this is, uh, I'm sorry, it's uh, Dr. Rosner. Um, Correctional Health Services um, also has a, a sexual assault uh, and abuse advocacy program, SAA, which um, has counselors uh, who meet with anyone um, uh, who reports through the health services. 
uh, and uh, also helps connect with uh, resources in the community. Private. Uh, uh, pri I mean, the, the SAA team are a group of advocates um, who work with correctional health, and then they have community partners as well. And in do they to the meet privately so. with yeah, the? Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. How many how many meetings? How, can you help correlate the number of meetings of those meetings to the number of uh, assault allegations? We can get the numbers for the sexual assault advocacy program and, and provide the number of visits to you. Yeah. But I will say we also, when we see patients in clinic after making an allegation, we refer all patients to SAA. Additionally, they're proactive. So they look through the medical charts. Anyone that's reported anything to us, they'll actually schedule a time to meet with them privately. So I'm hearing from people in the system or who are very familiar with people in the system. As I say, I'm not there. You're there every day. So I'm counting on others for facts that um, that in fact the calls are not are not private. They have to talk on the phones in their unit. Um, that they're not taken to a social service area when requested, um, and that mental health on average is on a 28 day schedule. Councilmember Rosenthal, and if I may. so even after an assault. Um, they might not see someone for 28 days. Council Member Rosenthal, if I may. Um, if in fact someone does want to, to see a DOC counselor, they can request to do so. Um, and, a, and a DOC counselor can assist them with making a phone call in a private setting if that is needed, if that is requested. Mm -hmm. and, and just on the mental health side of things, um, Whenever an allegation is brought to the health services, uh, patients are seen uh, as a stat referral, meaning uh, yeah. the mental health service offers counseling immediately. Yeah. Yeah. No, I know what stat means. I'm looking at a 28-day schedule. Yeah. So the 28-day number, I think, probably comes from some of the routine mental health services, but mm. that's very different than counseling after an allegation. That's very different. Yeah. So. Um, so I'm, I'm seeing, and I, I know it's true, and I think I'm hoping the public can hear this, that there's a real disconnect between, um, you know, I, I feel like the answers, you're, you're trying to answer my question with a rosy picture, but you're sort of interchanging, well, if they're with a DOC, they can talk to a DOC officer, that's not a mental health professional. They can talk to a mental health professional whenever and may or may not be in private situations. Here's the point. And, and you should really, if, if, you were, if this were happening correctly, because I've been at hearings or I've been in situations where it's happening sort of correctly, then you, have, then you know these many people have reached out these many people were connected to a private uh, conversation with an advocate uh, at Safe Horizons, somebody who is not uh, in any way affiliated with the system that is, uh, you know, uh, it, it truly not wanting to be exposed for any problem, right? Um, and, and that would be that, but I'm not hearing that answer. There's no way that, I mean, really just common sense. And again, I'm not in the system, but there's no way and we've talked about this at hearings before that the health provider is, um, takes, is, is of paramount importance compared to the mission of corrections, which is to keep people in corrections. So, you know, the, you know, just in the scale of things, health is here, corrections is here. And I'm just describing, I'm not making a statement or anything, I'm just describing um, reality. So given that, and now you have an inmate down here who has had a traumatic experience and is trying to report it, the, we, anything 
anything within that system is not safe. The only thing that is safe is calling somebody outside the system on a private line uh, or talking to someone from an advocate. It sounds like you have a contract with Safe Horizons, so you could have a room that is private where the person could talk with the Safe Horizons advocate. Then we know that we're getting an unbiased answer about what's happening. I mean, just by definition, no? Anything within the system? So council member, um, if I may, I just want to, uh, I really do appreciate what you're saying. Um, I, I wanna clarify what um, Executive Director Penson uh, was speaking about and then and sort of come back to your point. Um, I, I don't think that anybody here is saying that speaking to a DOC counselor is the same as speaking to a, a trained advocate. Um, what I understood her to be saying is that if somebody came to a DOC programs counselor and said, I want to speak in a private space, that the program counselor would help bring them to that space. But and I think how many we, people have done that? Well, I, well, I think you're pointing to is perhaps the need for the department to more clearly make the that availability known to people. Um, and I think because that the answer is no one has well, done I, it or very I, few I, people. I mean, I'm is, insinuating if your answer is, oh, we have to do that more clearly. That means very few, few people are doing it now. That's all well, I, I know. And going forward, more people will get that service. If I could just add, I, I just wanted to also mention, um, because I also appreciate your concern. I absolutely do. Um, I, I do want to make it clear that if there is an incarcerated person who does make a, an allegation of sexual assault and that um, that incarcerated person does go to mental, uh, excuse me, to medical, then Health and Hospitals has a sexual assault advocate that we contact in order to line that person up um, to provide that service. So I do want to put that out there as well. Um, and I also want to say that I think tracking purposes for people who take advantage, uh, people in custody who take advantage of Safe Horizons, I think it might be beneficial um, because we don't necessarily know since it's confidential if they do allay them, avail themselves of Safe Horizons. That's you, safe horizons uh, I mean, time out, Green Bay. Crack. Again, you're painting a very rosy picture that is really not collaborated by those in the system. So just, I want to make that clear to the public that I'm being flooded with texts saying this is just flat out not true. Um, and I mean, saying that you could never know the number because of privacy, of course you could know the aggregate number. I mean, don't let's let's not. You know, no, they're not required to tell us that. So, say for I mean, you could know. Over the past year, we've gotten ten private conversations. Anyway, um, let me ask you: What languages, if people, when you start to this new service of giving people an opportunity to talk with um, a Safe Horizons uh, counselor? What languages would you put that information in? The 10, um, we have a language access uh, plan and policy that we're developing. And so uh, at this time, uh, I believe it's Moya, requires that any important regular announcements be put in 10 different languages. And I would have to provide the list to you later of what those 10 are, I can't remember them all. Um, so we adhere to the language access uh, plan. If someone were to claim they, they had been raped within the last 24 hours, how quickly do they get to a hospital for a rape kit? Hi, this is Dr. Vessel. Um, they, would, they would be evaluated by our medical service and they would go immediately. How many times have, has that been, has, has that happened? in each calendar year? I would have to get exact numbers for you. Um, if I'm and that thinking could include, back, obviously, yeah. both, uh, you know, in whoever the perpetrator is. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to get those numbers for you. I don't, wanna, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna miss speak. That's okay, oh, I, 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 rounding is fine by me. Sure, so just off the top of my head. Oh yeah. no, I would, I would say off the top of my head, we probably have, it probably happens to be once a year. Once a year. 
somebody mm. comes forward, says they've been raped, and you send them off for a rape kit. And just to clarify that specifically okay. for the women within the women's facility, um, the, yeah. the numbers for the system as a whole may be di are, are certainly different. Yeah. How often does anybody in the system go to get a rape kit? Um, so each person who, who makes an allegation is seen by the medical service, and so we, you know, ask them the nature of what occurred, and if there was any, um, if there was, if it was appropriate, such as there was any physical pre penetration, then the person would go to the emergency room to get a rape kit. And about how many have done so? In the in the whole system, we'll have to get you that number uh, in follow up. But like, but like I said, regarding for Rose and Singer, it's on the order of one to two, you know, a, a year. We, we see everybody. And we for those them. cases that go to get a rape kit, how, how many come back positive that they've been raped? So the, the process at the hospital is the same as it would be in, in any emergency room where there are, you know, safe and sane um, trained uh, emergency room staff who perform the kit. Once, it's, uh, once uh, any forensic examination is undertaken at a hospital, it, it, it is totally out of the hands of Correctional Health Services. It, it goes through the same uh, chain of custody and same referrals to um, forensic investigations and to police if indicated um, that any hospital um, uh, process would, would undertake. So we don't, we're not privy so, when somebody goes to the Got it. So DOC and DOC Health as a system is, um, is flying blind when it comes to knowing how many people have documented rape cases so, uh, system. I'm just speaking to Correctional Health Services because we mm -hmm. are um, an independent clinical service. Sure, sure. Um, so we don't, we don't uh, I wasn't able to answer your question about how many uh, come back positive because that's ultimately a, a determination by police and um, a security agency. So I, I was just explaining that we are a clinical service and we uh, make sure we get people to the right place to be able to have those forensic kits. Completed. Anyone at DOC know how many of those forensic oh. kits come back positive a year? I'll tell you that in, in this year we had two uh, cases where we uh, referred to the district attorney's office uh, that are sexual assault cases. Incarcerated person was uh, the alleged victim and the alleged perpetrator was also an incarcerated person. And I believe that both of those uh, alleged victims did go to get a sexual assault kit done. And those cases have now been referred to the district, well, have been referred to the district attorney's office in, uh, immediately. And I believe that they, I don't want to speak for them, but I, I believe that there is a criminal prosecution moving forward on both cases. And so what have you done to protect uh, those who were raped? So the um, alleged incarcerated person who was the alleged perpetrator has been separated um, from the other individual. Um, and we, of course, uh, rely on our partners in the facility to manage um, the separation. We, of course, after that, um, have to look, at least the investigation division, where we just oversee staff misconduct, we have to also make sure that if there was any staff involvement in those incidents, meaning any um, negligence on their part, uh, that they are also held accountable. Um, and so we, we have to manage that situation as well. But for these two cases that I'm referring to, both of those cases were an incarcerated person uh, as the alleged perpetrator in, in that in that situation. With no staff involvement? Um, not, no, no, there was, there was staff involvement to the extent that we believed that there could have been um, better uh, oversight in the jail. Yes, there was, there is going to be administrative charges filed against those staff members, yes. How long has the process taken from when it happened to now? So um, we expedite that kind of 
case, obviously, the criminal portion to an external agency to prosecute criminally. And then internally, we take as many measures as possible to expedite charges and move forward with um, the oath trial. There is a process, a due process rights given to staff, where, like I had mentioned before, we can't unilaterally terminate any individual. What we can do is, is separate them from other um, uh, from inmates and serve them with their charges and go through this due process, which involves discovery sharing and um, trial dates that are set and then prosecuting them internally for administrative charges at, at trial. And so that's what we do in these kinds of situations. In the past five years, have any staff been terminated regarding this issue? Yes. Um, and in fact, there was a recent uh, situation where um, in lieu of going to trial, the staff member that we had charged decided to resign. So that, I mean, just so you know, people are apoplectic hearing that answer. I remember hearing that answer at our last hearing as well, that somebody be allowed to resign when they've been charged with and found guilty of a serious crime. Um, but let's even, is there anyone else besides that person? Well, uh, just to clarify, this person was not charged with a crime. Um, if somebody is charged and convicted of a crime, that is the only way that we are allowed to unilaterally terminate. Has anyone and been charged and convicted of a crime? No, not in the past. Not a staff member, not in the past few years, not since I have. Um, Do you not personally feel that that's an accurate reflection mm -hmm. of reality? I guess that question is also for the health services folks. That's all right. You don't, I know this is all legal stuff. I'm wondering about um, specialized training for DOC staff at Rosie's, particularly for the incoming class. Um, have you made any changes to the training? Uh, in the sense that maybe advocates and formerly incarcerated women are consulted on the training or on the um, definition of the job description itself. Um, well, yeah. yeah. We're currently working with um, the MOSS group um, to develop a gender responsive training. Um, the staff at- What's it called? We're working with the MOSS group on- M-O-S-S? -S? Yes, the MOSS group. Okay. Um, a gender responsive training um, that all staff will be required to take um, to help to give them an understanding of the unique needs of women and how we can best support them. Okay. And so you're not taking into account anyone who's been through the system or New York City advocates? I'm sorry. I'm just looking at the Moss Group um, online, just doing a quick search. And what I'm asking is, have you considered or will there be any uh, New York City advocates or uh, people who have been incarcerated at Rosie's to be part of that training? I think the training is, uh, still in development, as I understand it, we have not finalized any curriculum. We have not finalized um, the, the, the contents of the training, and so I think those are all things that we can consider as we move forward. So, just for public clarification, the training that I sat in on um, at at Rikers, it was a pre. Uh, I'm pretty sure council member powers can correct me, um, but I'm sure I, I'm pretty sure it was a PREA training and um, to by an outside group that I don't know if you're working with anymore. Um, I have to say the training was was uh, less than good. Um, 
and could have really benefited from somebody with experience in the New York City jail system. Um, so what criteria did you use to choose this group? So the Moss group um, was actually um, influential in the creation of the PREA standards themselves. Do they know anything about the New York City jail system? They do. They work, they work closely with the department. And they so, work, so you've hired them before? We've worked with them before. And they, as I mentioned, uh, were, were influential in the creation of the federal PREA standards. And so how long have you worked with them? So this isn't a new contract. This is the usual contract you have. So I, I certainly cannot speak to that. Um, we can we can follow up with more information about the duration of this contract or the specific. Have they ever given the PREA training at Riker at any DOC facility before? I'm sorry. As well. Have they given a PREA training at any Rikers facility? Uh, well, our our trainers provide the training. I'm sorry, I don't know if anyone else is having trouble following the answers. Um, I feel like it, they're very fluid. Um, I, I'm just asking you, 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 you uh, I don't know how to say this more clearly. Have you hired this consultant before or no? We've worked with this consultant over, uh, I believe, several years on a variety of projects. Have, have they been projects other than PRIA? Again, I'm not able to speak to that, um, but I'm happy to, we can follow up with additional information offline. Have these trainers ever met with people, formerly incarcerated um, people at DOC? Yes or no? So again, I, I, they have, the MOSS group are, are national experts in PREA. They have been to this facility. They have spoken- So the answer is no. Staff. So no, they've never correct. met privately. Let's just be clear. I, I, I hear the rosy answers you're giving, but, but just to be clear, and I'll say it to the public and you can tell me it's true or not true, the, the group that DOC has hired to do the PREA training has never met privately with any advocates or people who have been through the DOC system. No, they, they have absolutely spoken to people in custody. They speak to people in custody all of the time. Privately? I. I can't speak to... Do you understand the importance of the difference between privately and just sort of when everyone else is around? So um, they speak... So they, they speak to... They speak to people in custody when they do audits. They speak to people in custody. They speak to our staff. They've trained our staff. They have met with advocates. Nationally known. And they are nationally known for their work and, and being experts in this particular area. Have they ever been, have those individuals ever been directly impacted by a DOC experience? They, they speak to people who are currently in our custody. So I would say the answer to that. Yeah. Have they ever spoken with them privately? I, I don't know their method of meeting with people in custody. Would they be um, allowed to? Yes. Yes. Have you ever offered them that opportunity? Yes, they have done it. They, they have done that, yes. Now they've done it. Okay, so they have met privately or they have, okay. So I, I see other people shaking their head too. So I'm not the only one confused. Um, I think, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, you would have to document that in some way. Um, is, is Moss Group here to answer questions given that they're the PREA consultants and they're the, that's the topic of the hearing? So we don't uh, generally have consultants speak um, 
Okay. We don't, but we, 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 so you don't, you well, don't. We, the Department of Correction is here to speak. And I, I do want to clarify again that they do meet with people in custody privately. They have met with advocates and they meet with our staff and train our staff. I just want to be very clear on those points. Right. And I want to be very clear that that's a very different answer than I got five minutes ago. And, um, and that is true because I am not the expert. I personally am not an expert in the work of the Moss Group. But as we are talking, I'm getting additional information from people who are. And so I don't want to misspeak or misrepresent the work of especially an external partner on behalf of the agency in a public meeting. But I have received additional information and can confirm to you that they meet with people in custody in private settings. They meet with our staff. Private, and by private settings, you mean with no camera or microphone in the room? So our, we don't have microphones in our facilities. Um, I don't think that it would, and again, I would defer to DC Townsend, but I don't think it would be advisable to have people with uh, in, people in custody in space with no That's camera. That's okay. I'm getting texts saying that the meetings take place in a room with cameras. For, and that is, you know, certainly for the safety of, of people in custody as well. So I, but I just, again, want to be very clear about the, the work of the Moss Group includes specific meetings with people in custody, with our staff, um, and with advocates. I'm seeing here that um, clergy are allowed to do follow up, but clergy are not that they don't for people who uh, say they've been sexually assaulted or harassed. Do, do you have a sense of how often clergy meet with people and are they allowed to do so in private? So are, we actually have a um chaplaincy hotline that we created during the course of the pandemic. So people in custody have access to clergy um, through that hotline at any time during out of cell time. Uh, so any, any of those 14 hours. Um, I, they, people have the opportunity to follow up with their clergy member at their discretion. So just starting this year, never before, but during COVID, Previously, clergy um, would have the opportunity to uh, round. Um, they would have the opportunity to, people would have more direct access, but we created this online. And it's something that, we'll con that I, I we're considering continuing um, because it's been useful. Got it. And so um, how many of those calls can be made in private to a hotline? So um, those, those calls are made through the uh, telephones that are available in the day room um, or available to people in custody in, in their housing unit. <clears throat> so none. Unless there is a specific request to make that, um, that call in a private area. So that would all, all already draw attention to that person if they were to say, I want to make a call in private. How many people make calls in private? That's, uh, I don't think that's any number that we would have right now. Um, I'm not sure that that's something that we track. It's not. Mm -hmm. Do any? It, it's not something that we track. Can you think of one? I understand the question. Um, yeah. Has anybody okay. asked you? Let's see hotline in a private setting. That's okay. I'm just, I'm. My knowledge um, is not but they're afforded the opportunity to make a, a call in private. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'm reading, I'm getting a note here that um, in 2019, the Bronx DA said 60% of all the 2018 uh, cases made against were made against officers. These are PREA cases. Um, and so that's in the Bronx. Um, but the Manhattan DA says for 2018, there were none. 
Do you think there are differences in how DAs um, take the information that they're given when you look at boroughs, when you look at the system borough by borough? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, I oh. do think that part of it is, I do think that part of it is just the level of population because mm -hmm. there's a one jail in Manhattan versus Rikers Island, which the Bronx DA handles all criminal activity that, that is involved on Rikers Island. I think that might explain the difference. Can I ask you, yeah, got it, that's fair. Uh, can I ask you now and to, to council member Holden's point about folks being vaccinated, um, do you, are you comfortable now letting clergy back into the facilities? So our clergy never left the facilities. DOC has clergy uh, who work for the department and they have continued to work. Um, some of them have worked in the facilities. Some of them have worked remotely. DOC staff um, have been back. DOC clergy staff, you mean? That is correct. So all clergy are back in the facilities? So um, many of our clergy have been in the facilities. Um, some individuals may have, you know, some sort of additional medical need that has prevented them from coming back, but our clergy are working in the facilities. Okay. Just as an FYI, I'm, I'm getting a lot of texts about the importance of clergy. Um, and uh, um, Uh, and that actually access to them is quite limited. Um, so if you could take that back and sort of think about it um, and get back. All right, I, I'm all right. gonna- I'm sorry, this is, De oh, this is De Rivera. In Hi. reference to the clergy, uh, the clergy, they do make tours um, within the facility, the, uh, being with the, with the COVID, we can't hold congregate services, but they do conduct tours within the housing areas to offer the women support and to um, inquire if they need any type of services. Even now during the time of Ramadan, which we recognize, we are holding Ramadan services and the Iman is reporting to the facility. So we are offering um, clergy services in that aspect. We just can't hold congregate services at this time. Mm -hmm. So just so you know, I'm hearing from people who are, you know, affiliated with this, with people who are in the system that yeah. there's not, a, it's not as rosy as the picture you're painting and that okay. people would like more access to clergy. Listen, I'm going to, um, I'm going to leave it here. I think the biggest takeaway for me was the importance um, for your uh, um, folks who do training to have private access to people affiliated with the DOC system, either as advocates or former uh, in, incarcerated people, um, for, for them to, to actually have private meetings because you know the general PREA training is not um, being, uh, um, is not enough for folks who are in the DOC system that they really need um, to, to, to understand the ins and outs of New York City system. So that's the biggest takeaway I get from that. And I appreciate that you're open to working on all this legislation um, and I look forward to doing so with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And appreciation to the chairs for the extended time. I know it was ridiculous. So thank you. Councilman Rosenthal. Um, seeing no other council members with their hands up, we are returning to Chair Diaz for additional questions before proceeding to public testimony. Chair Diaz. Thank you. I want to first commend my council member, friend, <laughs> and colleague, Rosenthal, for the for tough questions, the mindful questions. And I admire that steadfast communication that you have with the public today. You're asking the questions that they're unable to ask. So again, I appreciate you and your support and continuing to be part of the gender and equity conversation, which definitely is a big one. I, I was informed, again, uh, also via text that within our transgender community um, that are incarcerated, when it comes to reporting rapes or assault, uh, they're not coming forward or they're, 
this conversation, but they're not reporting it. How are we providing services for, for them that are indeed sharing that they have their victims, but not comfortable in moving forward? What support systems do we have in place? And, and is that true? I, I will answer the part about the coming forward. I, I'll uh, defer to my colleagues about the support systems. Um, I We have had individuals um, come forward. Um, and so I, I don't know that in my experience I've had, I've seen a reluctance, but of course that's not necessarily a fair thing to say, right? Because I only get it. I only get the information if I get the information. So um, I will say that we have had individuals, uh, transgender individuals come forward in the past, um, but you're right, you know, if you're thinking that it's possible that people are not coming forward and I'm just not aware of it. Um, so I'll defer to my colleagues with respect to any kind of additional support that we have been able to give uh, to our uh, transgender incarcerated people. So the transgender uh, population falls into the LGBTQ spectrum. And as a result, our director of LGBTQ um, has worked really hard to uh, establish a clear line of communication with people in custody who identify uh, on that spectrum and provide um, supportive services through one-to-one -one, uh, in individual discussions in private with them as well as um, the, um, the hotline that I think we mentioned earlier. Um, we also have uh, started a new program where volunteers, uniform and non-uniform staff, um, will have an identifiable pin on their lapel uh, as somebody who is um, willing and uh, knowledgeable about their issues for them to come and speak to them. Um, so that broadens the access and availability for people to come forward and, and speak privately with somebody. Additionally, the PREA staff meet with the transgender population on a weekly basis in an effort to address any issues that arise and decrease the conflicts in the housing areas. And also, if I may add to that, if an individual doesn't feel comfortable speaking to somebody in a public setting within the housing unit, they can also message their concerns via tablet. And then that concern would be messaged out and be addressed. Okay. Thank you. My next question to you is the suicide rate. Post-COVID, pre-COVID, what do your numbers look like? If, if there is any data, I'm interested in, in hearing about it. Are you asking if about people have- Yes. Committed suicide at Yeah, no. Rosies. No, ma'am. Um, since my assignment there, and to, and to my knowledge, I'm, I can say that we haven't had any individual um, commit suicide. Any attempts of suicide? No. What programs are offered to women or you know, individuals at, at Rosie's to advance themselves while, while they're there? Sure. Um, thank you for that question. So I'll start off with our Rose Petal Boutique. Um, in December 2019, we launched the Rose Petal Boutique um, at the Rose and Singer Center. Um, the Rose Petal Boutique was developed with uh, people in custody. They helped to, um, to design the boutique. Um, the boutique is stocked with business clothing. So the, the Rose Petal Boutique is designed to prepare individuals for uh, professional development opportunities upon release from custody. So in addition to that, um, we also have our workforce development unit. Our workforce development unit provides uh, pathways to employment for individuals in DOC custody and offers classes such as cosmetology, barbering, flagging, barista, and more. I, I need to know the more. We, we can get you that. So you do cosmetology, flagging, and what was, uh, and when we say flagging, I'm thinking that's construction work? Yes. Okay. Awesome. 
And could you tell me what is the, the population? Give me a percentage that actually participates, that begins your, your programs and actually successfully completes. We can get you that number. Okay. Then I'd like to go back to, to mental health services. Um, Thrive NYC has a program where one can be um, first help, a first um, responder for mental health, which I used a couple of months ago, you know, drinking and, drinking and driving incident. I parked in the middle of, of uh, three lanes and, and assisted someone who was intoxicated and the friend who was trying to get him from, from driving, you know, the fear of, of killing people. You know, I, as, as, as I dealt with the situation and was able to calm the friend down that was trying to help his friend and the one that was drunk in the back seat and I pulled away, I realized that because of the interaction that I had in the training, I was able to meet the person that was a drunk where he was. I, I asked if he wanted to dance. We did the cha-cha slide, we did some salsa, he laughed. I, it teaches us to figure out a way to connect with individuals. And I'm wondering, is this um, a, um, a program or that you've shared with, with the women? You know, mental health to me, again, it's, it's serious. I'm so serious for many of us. And we just don't know how people are at, at, at a moment. And sometimes just having that, that basic conversation with someone a peer can get one from a negative thought to a positive or just a time of reflection of it's gonna be better tomorrow. So do you know of Thrive NYC and, and the first aid certification program it's a simple eight hour program and I'd like to know, A, if you have, um, and B, if you haven't, what are your thoughts of starting to implement it as a program that you provide? That first aid program has been part of the academy training. Do we, can you give me an average of folks that are participating? Everybody who goes through the academy participates. So, if there's 100 people, we now have 100 people that are empowered. So um, the department, if you, if you don't mind, no. um, actually reports some of this information through its annual uh, trauma-informed care report. Um, the most recent one was published on April 10th of this year. It's on our website. Um, and uh, it appears that, looking at this report right now, that almost 9,000 staff members were trained um, since 2014. It's about 8,700, uh, about 8,800. Um, in addition, uh, approximately 1,188 incarcerated individuals were also trained in the mental health first aid program. Okay. Can you share with me how many CBOs you're working with currently? It's a CBO. It's a CBO? Sorry. What's the community based organizations that provide services? How many contracts do you have? with outside resources that come in to work with your, with your clients. You mentioned you provide um, employment opportunities. I'd like to know what organizations are coming in to provide that opportunity. Is it in-house? Is it outsourced? So our Rosebud Boutique is in-house, um, but we do work with some community-based organizations for both um, for individuals while they're incarcerated and once they return to the community. We're working with providers such as Green Hope Services for Women, the Osborne Association, Fortune Society to provide both services in-house and once they return to the community. Okay, my next, my next question would be the line of, of housing and um, unifying families. What's your, what's your process? So the Meaning, process- do, do, you, do you increase visits, you know, the, the teleconference conversations, do you invite ACS to the conversation? Is there a mental health component when you're trying to reunite families as, as a, the predominant care provi provider is going to be reunited with their families and, and their children? I think, did you want to answer that? Yeah. You know, we're moving to an individualized approach to individual needs. So, you know, not to make blanket statements because, uh, you know, one size does not fit all with regard to programming or release planning. So we complete an individualized assessment upon intake. 
So we understand that individuals needs and risks and if families involved, that is absolutely going to be something that is discussed. And now that we are working towards um, the new RFP coming into play, as soon as we're allowed to have providers back on island, um, we have identified very specific providers to be able to help us address the needs of women, both inside the institution, as well as a handoff to our community partners through uh, the mock day contracts once they re-enter the community so families can certainly be re-engaged re with each other. Okay, so I, I, I draw my Diaz. Um, I was in, been incarcerated for a year. We're getting ready for, for my release. My mom has had my daughter and mom cannot take me in. What do we do to secure housing as we're trying to unify the, the family and exiting into a, part of a positive, meaningful environment that most likely would not lead to incarceration or for any fear of unnecessary stress. Sure, so we work with our partners in Mock J. Um, if someone identifies as not having some um, a place to live upon return to the community, we work with Mock J um, who will find them emergency um, residents while they work with them to find a permanent setting. So does that mean to me, well, come, coming um, prior to, to being a member as of December 1st was my last day after 13 years working within the shelter, working in the shelter system. And my understanding of release means is a nice, pretty glorified letter, which acts path to take in the family. And that's not, doesn't do much. It means that you're in the system the system meaning the shelter, the DHS shelter system, anywhere between 365 days to three years. Do you have a housing component that can help individuals that know they're going to face this challenge with exiting shelter? You know, we have Housing Connect. You know, that, that's a way out. We have Housing Advocates. What conversation are we truly having? Placing someone who's been confined into the shelter environment, brings up displacement and hardship, not for the adult, not just for the adult, but for the child. What are you thoughts on improving Council. your system as you're bringing in providers? Council Member Diaz, just to clarify a couple of things. We're in the midst of a transition that you may or may not be aware of. So I just I'm not aware. Okay. Um, we're transitioning um, the way we do business uh, with regard to uh, release planning. It used to be that the DOC had all of that contract uh, provider work on our end, on the institutional side. Um, but what happened in the last year or more now uh, is that that contract got split in half. So now the DOC is gonna be responsible for in-facility programming and providing a handoff, if you will, to our community partners. So MockJ has the other half of the equation on the community side. And I'm sure Dana Kaplan can speak to that piece of it. And so what we're talking about, we're in conversations with MockJ regularly, and we're having conversations about having MockJ staff, if you will, come into the jails and be that reentry uh, discharge planner um, in partnership with our DOC staff. So if I'm a counselor working in one of the housing units and I identify you as being homeless and having a child that's in somebody else's custody, um, that information would then be shared with one of these MockJ reentry specialists who then knows that they need to pick that up and carry it through into the community with regard to housing placements. And I'll defer to Dana Kaplan to speak to how they find housing. Sure. Uh, so good afternoon, uh, members of the council, and thank you, uh, Council Member Diaz, for that question. So uh, a little bit, I think one of the things that I wanted to highlight is actually, I don't want to call anything about this pandemic a silver lining, but one of the models that we have been able to do uh, during COVID is something that I think has some really positive implications longer term, which is emergency reentry hotels. So essentially since March of last year, uh, 
rather than going into the DHS system, what we have been able to provide is um, uh, a warm handoff from for anyone in DOC custody, obviously uh, women, but this is not uh, specific just to women, uh, who do not have a place to go, to go to one of four hotels that are throughout the city where we have nonprofit providers on site doing case management services. Um, unfortunately, right now, we have just hit capacity at, in those hotels. So obviously this is one of the challenges. Um, we're uh, placing people from both the local jails as well as uh, people from state facilities. And so, you know, I do wanna acknowledge that although we keep on adding sites, we are at capacity at the moment. And so that is definitely a challenge. Um, but we have had, I think we have right now close to approximately 500 individuals um, throughout these four sites and have also been able to, with the nonprofit providers, and this is Exodus Transitional Services that is providing uh, the nonprofit service that, or the case management services at each site. They're doing a fantastic job. They stood up <laughs> this program within days. Um, so their case management services have been able to place um, hundreds, I don't have the exact number, but about a month ago, the numbers were about 300 individuals. Again, this is uh, both the, um, you know, the entire population, not just specific to women, uh, into longer term housing. There is dedicated floors within the hotels that are specific to the female population. Um, and so there are, um, you know, people on staff that are on site working specifically with women in the hotels. Now, obviously the other question is what are longer term um, transitional housing options? And so we do currently have uh, a contract with a number of transitional housing providers, including Women's Community Justice Association, who I see um, there are some folks uh, who are here at the hearing from, from that organization and nonprofit and do great services. Um, and so they have some of those beds right now Obviously, we need to continue to expand those housing opportunities. And so there is an RFP um, for additional transitional housing beds uh, that is forthcoming shortly. Um, it's <laughs> been <laughs> forthcoming shortly for longer than I would like to be, <laughs> to be quite honest, but it is something um, that will be going out soon. And what that will do is go from the current $5 million in funding to $12.5 million and then up to $25 million in funding for transitional housing beds and including beds for specialized populations. Um, as the Department of Correction said, we are working closely right now with DOC to uh, on this new reentry system <laughs> in which DOC is holding the contracts uh, for providers that are in the facilities, but MACJ has taken over the contracts for the in-custody uh, re-entry services and really with the intention there being to ensure that we have very, very community-based um, services citywide and particularly services that are relevant for um, the female population. And so Women's Prison Association uh, is a, um, has been awarded the contract at the community side um, to provide those services, but what we're also working on is making sure that there's a number of other subcontractors as well so that we can have a real neighborhood-based component to this. And so we are working right now on um, how to best have an integrated system so that there can be that warm hop handoff and effective discharge planning at the point of, you know, a woman's experience in custody to uh, their ultimate um, release and, you know, placement in, in the program, including access to housing. So it is uh, a system in progress. <laughs> and I think we all can acknowledge, you know, where we know there's rooms for improvement and a continued need for better housing options um, at a, a broader scale, but it's something we're very focused on right now. I, I want to thank you um, for your efforts. I, I want to, um, I'm hoping that my colleagues in the city council are listening to this. They're looking to expand. My district probably has the most amount of shelters in the district. We can only take what so much. My colleagues that are turning down opportunities for shelters, let's be honest, they're people. 
Not everyone that goes into the shelter system is coming out of incarceration, is not worthy of being in your neighborhoods. They, they, don't, they don't belong in, in just minority communities. We need to responsibly share the wealth. So, I mean, Kaplan, I, my blessings to you. You're fighting a hard fight. You know, through the rezone in, the, in, the, in my district, the mayor committed to 350 units and because of COVID and funding issues, the developer is looking to take 75% of what's supposed to be affordable community units and transitioning them into temporary shelter for, for, for supportive housing folks. The 37th Councilmatic District is not the only district. So please listen to this conversation. Housing is a human right, and we need to share the responsibility. I, I can't speak for my other colleagues, but I can speak for myself. The 37th Councilmatic District needs your help. Open your doors, open your minds. I'm comfortable with you selecting the population that you're comfortable with, but please share the burden with me because I can only do so much. Moving on to that, and, and, and thank you for thinking outside the box and putting individuals in hotels. It's great to have a place you can call your own. What's disheartening is that the hotels do not allow for a hot plate, they do not allow for a coffee maker, they do not allow for a microwave. When I was first diagnosed with COVID, I spent 10 days in a, in a hotel as a city program. I called downstairs after receiving cold French toast, and I love French toast. Um, my breakfast was French toast sticks, um, a frittata, um, and something else. And when I said it's cold, I, I called downstairs and I said, how do I warm it up? Is there a microwave? I, I wanted to have some soup later on the, at that day, and I and I had some with me that my daughter had packed for me. And they told me once something goes into your room, you cannot we cannot help you with it. So I'm, and I said so I need a microwave. So I was told that corporate says no. So our families in shelter, when you sign in, the microwave is taken away. How does a mom take care of her babies? They're coming out from being incarcerated, that beautiful, amazing opportunity. You know, we eat, right? We eat that in my household, whether it's a snack, that, that intimate conversation that you have around food in that setting is taken away from families. Something simple as a microwave goes a long way. So what's part of what's happening is when you're not able to warm up your meal, that's really what it is, or Science is so creative now that we can make a muffin. We can make an egg in the microwave. Our families, our individuals in the, in the hotels don't have that opportunity. So I like, thank you for being creative. The system needs to know that it continues to be broken. I needed to take antibiotics. And it was quite difficult when I was served cold breakfast. And, you, and I was told, you, you, can, you can call DoorDash. Well, that's great. And thankfully, I was in a financial position to order. But our families can't do that. Our families are taking their food stamps and going to the local grocery store. If our moms, if the head of household leaves their child in the hotel room and goes to get something warm for their child, now it's an ACS case. Because now you've abandoned your child. And if security, doesn't understand them and the value of what's going on, it makes it even worse. So again, I thank you for trying, but we need to figure out as a government body, how we're gonna deal with the fact that our families cannot have more meals. Think about all the people that have mental health issues that cannot take their medication. It's not okay. You know, I'm told that, you know, um, we live by experience, right? And we, we, we get to the council, how we try to make it different, you're, you're, you're welcome. You're, you're, you may, um, as a Victoria, you're, you're welcome. You know, this, this is real talk. Our people need us and they need us bad. So if we're getting into a contract, 
with a hotel that's saying, we'll take your money, that's great. But you need to provide services that make sense. It makes no sense to me. I was not allowed. You know what, can you imagine, I'm, I'm in a room, I can't leave for 10 days. Behind this door, I went under my, to my TV's here, and there's a, there's a, a computer station. And I look, and I notice that there is a microwave behind there, enclosed. Then I'm, I'm MacGyver, so I'm trying to figure out how do, I, how do I take the screw, the drywall screw that was used. I know, Pa, I was, I, I Chair Pa was, I don't know if you're, if you're visualizing it, but the closest thing I had was my, was my brand new socks. So I'm sitting on the floor and I'm trying to figure out how do I unscrew the drywall screw? And then I couldn't ask my family or my staff to bring me right, an, an electric drill. So if this is Darby Diaz, the councilwoman telling you of my struggles, can you imagine the person is coming out of incarceration, knows the limitations, the fear of government and institution? I could have easily kicked over that door. I could have. What are they going to do? They would have known to 10 days after I left. I would have my soup. I would have my tea when I wanted and needed it. I'm, I'm, at this point, I'm being redundant. But I want you to understand that contracts have to be looked at and serious conversation needs to happen. Transitioning from incarceration to temporary housing, it's a band-aid, and we really have to take a look at it. Thinking again, our families are not going in there for a couple of days. They're in there for months and sometimes years. And that's, that's not okay. I wanted to also share with you, I don't know if, if moving forward is a thought and process. Under family unification, when you have um, an, AC, an ACS case, they start, trend, when you do your transition process, they link you up with New York City Housing Authority and start that exit process. So the moment the mom is re re reunited with her child, <clears throat> their application is already in the system. So if they have to go into a shelter, I've had cases that in 15 days, my families are out of shelter and into permanent housing. That's success. That's what we have to push for. But if families have to go into transitional housing, it's really short-lived, then we can monitor that. If you want success, housing is a human right. Then I, I might, I'm gonna go take, have some water, take a minute. There's another question in, in reference to, um, also back you know, to, to housing. I like to know what are we doing with, with moms that are, that are confined and and they're little people little people to me you know is, is their children how how do how do the children interact with moms that are sanctioned for a certain amount of hours a day sanctions in restricted housing i have to say um I currently don't have any uh, women in restrictive housing in my restrictive housing unit. Amazing. And when was the last time you did have someone? March 26. Of 2019 or 2021? <clears throat> Thank you. You're welcome. Again. I'm, I'm reading my text messages. I, I, I guess I'm becoming popular. Thank you, Chair Rosenthal. <laughs> All right. It's, uh, I think we have to start moving just because we're kind of at one o'clock here. So yeah. uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to forego my second round of questions here, and uh, we'll have folks come up to testify as well. So thank you to CHS, Department of Corrections, for your testimony and answers. We'll follow up with you as needed on information, and uh, we'll move on if kick out call up the first round of testimony. Thank you. Thanks. We will now turn to testimony from members of the public. Please listen for your name as I will be calling individuals one by one and we'll also announce the person who is next. 
Once your name is called, please accept the prompt to unmute yourself and the Sergeant at Arms will set the timer and announce that you may begin. Your testimony will be limited to two minutes. The first panel is uh, our defenders. I would like to now welcome Danny Green to testify, followed by Simone Spirig, then Lindsay Lewis and Jane Samper. Clock is ready. Defenders. I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm from the LGBTQ Defense Project at the Bronx Defenders. I represent transgender people who are facing criminal charges, many who have been recently incarcerated or are currently incarcerated. Over the past several years, much attention has been paid to the abuse of transgender women who are incarcerated in city jails, and many improvements have been made. That being said, uh, there are still a lot, there's still a lot of room for improvement in the DOC adopting policies that permit transgender women to be housed in female facilities and in the special consideration unit at Rose M. Singer. The Bronx Defenders LGBTQ Defense Project, as well as other advocates, have worked with many women who continue to be unsafely housed in men's jails while in custody at DOC. Because of the significant limitations on the SCU's eligibility and the lack of transparency in the acceptance process, many transgender women are housed in men's jails still. Sadly, but foreseeably, many of our clients are harassed and abused while in male facilities. I want to highlight for the committee one persistent issue um, that we've seen repeatedly lately, and that's the removal of transgender women from housing consistent with their gender identity as a form of punishment. For example, a transgender woman may be housed initially consistently with her gender identity, but when that the, the transgender woman files a complaint against another inmate, if an inmate files a complaint against her, or if a transgender woman is subject to discipline, she's regularly moved to a male facility. This often occurs prior to the initiation of investigation, which is particularly problematic considering many of the comments filed against transgender women are motivated by transphobia. We believe this policy is discriminatory, it's dangerous, and it's in violation of New York City law, as well as state and federal constitutions. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Next, we'll hear from Simone Sperig, followed by Lindsay Lewis, then Jane Samper. Clock is ready. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Simone Spirig and I'm the Jail Services Social Worker at Brooklyn Defender Services. Thank you to Chair Powers and Chair Diaz for holding today's hearings. One day is all it takes to cause harm and trauma, and yet the department historically fails to understand the urgency to protect transgender women in their custody, putting lives at risk. Due to time, I wanna share a story experienced by a transgender woman. This is one story, but it represents the many stories of how the department drags their feet to safely house transgender women in their custody. When Ms. B entered custody, she immediately requested placement in the women's jail. Yet despite her own advocacy and advocacy from our office, DOC left her in a men's jail for well over a month where she was repeatedly threatened and sexually harassed, including by DOC staff. Eventually, Priya staff came to meet with Ms. B about her placement in Rosie's and it took at least another week for Ms. B to learn of her approval for the SCU, a decision that should have been made on day one of her incarceration. Now almost a month into Ms. B's incarceration and despite approval for the SCU, DOC kept her in the men's jail, sleeping in an open dorm where she continued to be verbally and sexually harassed by men in her housing unit. This included one man who would follow Ms. B into the bathroom to watch her shower. Ms. B felt extremely unsafe in her housing unit and reported this to her steady officer who discounted the harassment as harmless and refused to follow up. It was only after multiple 311 calls and efforts from our office that Ms. B was eventually moved with no explanation from DOC for the dangerous delay. Situations like this should never exist, yet they do and with regularity and no accountability. It's been our overwhelming experience that DOC staff consistently fails to respond with the urgency that's needed to protect transgender women in their custody. These interactions and decisions are not only ethically problematic, but they are also extremely dangerous. I wanna end on this. Laylene Polanco, a transgender woman, died in DOC custody while in a solitary unit. This council must pass legislation to truly end solitary confinement 
and by any other name in New York City jails for all people. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Lindsay Lewis, followed by Jane Samper. Talk is ready. Hi, my name is Lindsay Lewis, and I'm a forensic social worker at NYCDS. We support all of the bills on today's agenda, but I want to provide more context for these bills. The number one need in Rosie's is higher quality and frequency of mental health and medical services while, for women while incarcerated. Medication without psychotherapeutic treatment will not solve the problem, nor will one visit with social workers after a complaint is made. I have been called by the director of mental health at Rosie's and told my client is not able to see mental health whenever they need or request it. In fact, the women get further traumatized by high rates of sexual assault in the jail, physical fights, coercion by guards, and being uprooted from their communities and children. The New York Times came out with an article this weekend stating that COs consistently lie, protect their own, and DOC allows this behavior and these guards to remain employed. Ultimately, what we want by DOC and COs is accountability for their actions with outside investigations and true change. You can train officers as much as you want, but that is not rehabilitation to those institutionalized. I'm privileged today to read the testimony of an NYCDS client, Ms. Rona Love. In her testimony, she speaks to some of the trauma exposure of a woman incarcerated at Rosie's. She states, the Department of Corrections seems to punish the LGBTQ community more than anyone else. The medical system in jail is a failure for our specific needs. Even if we are behaving well, we are denied services. We can't get to mental health when we want to or need it. I had a death in my family and was denied additional mental health services. No one ever told me my brother was seriously ill in the hospital and no one ever told me when he died. I was not able to see a chaplain or rabbi as requested. You are in a hell by yourself here. This is why there's so much violence in my community. The Board of Corrections is far from understanding the problems going on here. There are lots of good officers, but some bad ones. And the overall problem is that the officers have no control. In my community, when people act out, they are shipped out. When other non-LGBTQ people act out, they are not transferred to a facility with a gender they do not identify with as punishment. They just get written up. Officers will have other inmates called prion people in RMSC to get them removed and transferred. The trans community has tried to request investigations of officers mis misconduct, but we are ignored. And I can stop there, but it is in my written testimony. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Jane Samper, followed by our next panel of Kelly Grace Price, Michelle Evans, and Donna Hilton. Clock is ready. Ms. Samper, you're not coming through. Okay, we can um, come back. No. Oh, there you go. We hear you now. Okay, um, great. Um, sorry about that. Um, again, my name is Jane Sampier. I'm the principal attorney and coordinator for the Legal Aid Society's Women's Pretrial Release Initiative. Uh, in this capacity, I represent women who are detained in city jails and advocate for their release and connection to community-based supportive services. To be clear, we believe the only way to protect women from the compounding trauma of incarceration is to completely limit uh, their exposure to New York City jails. Now, it's well documented that the vast majority of women who are incarcerated in city jails have experienced significant trauma prior to their incarceration. And for survivors of sexual assault, domestic violence, and other form of, forms of trauma, uh, the very nature of incarceration and routine procedures is often re-traumatizing. Uh, certainly, DOC has an obligation to protect incarcerated people, not only from illicit assaults, um, and, uh, both uh, physical assaults and sexual assaults, as well as providing mental health and uh, physical health care, but they also have an obligation to refrain from practices and behaviors that exacerbate trauma um, and violence. Uh, the, so to that end, we believe the city should hold a hearing to further explore and eradicate the many practices uh, that the practices and policies that result in uh, said compounding trauma. Uh, a few examples um, of these sort of practices that result in the compounding trauma are strip searches, punitive segregation, and the way uh, many lockdowns are implemented. Now, although strip searches are intended to locate hidden contraband, 
The practice itself is very invasive, degrading and traumatizing to anyone that's subjected to them, but uh, especially to women who have a history of sexual abuse. Women have described this practice as triggering, dehumanizing and terrifying. Uh, punitive segregation or placement in isolated confinement only serves to amplify the harm women experience in jails, including problems maintaining dignity and obtaining um, basic hygiene supplies, as well as access to mental health. And it also leads to the increased vulner vulnerability um, in, <coughs> of incarcerated women to the abuse of uh, the abuse by staff and other forms of and, and forms of harassment, um, as well as um, again not not having access to to their 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 community supports. Um, as far as uh, lockdowns are concerned, um, the actual practice of lockdowns to to prevent um, but for the violent or investigate violent violent um, Incidences is not itself objectionable, but we, there is there is many examples in which this policy is abused and results in compounding trauma. So to that end, we're just requesting that uh, that this committee convene a hearing to address the many different policies of DOC that result in additional um, harm and trauma to incarcerated women. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Kelly Grace Price, followed by Michelle Evans, and then Donna Hilton. Oh, it's ready. <clears throat> <clears throat> Hi, good afternoon. It's Kelly Grace Price from Close Rosies. Thank you so much for this hearing. I've already submitted um, a draft of testimony, mm -hmm. which I will attend and I will resubmit to, to the committee and council. I really want to thank um, especially um, Chair Diaz and Helen Rosenthal for their very thoughtful questions mm -hmm. today regarding data. <clears throat> it's still a giant hole in our ability to rein in the terrible horrors of rape and sexual assault on Rosie's. I wanna mention that as much as data is missing from this hearing today, <clears throat> Commissioner Braun is missing from this hearing today. And her absence seems to be a metaphor for <clears throat> the lack of transparency that we keep receiving or not receiving from the Department of Corrections. Today is day 50 of her absence. It would be great if we could know what's going on with the commissioner. I have a feeling that maybe perhaps some of the reason that we don't have complete data today is because of lack of leadership in the DOC. Um, I do, however, I don't wanna be too heavy handed. I wanna congratulate the DOC on one thing. They seem to have <clears throat> cured the problem of sexual assault on visitors. <laughs> Although maybe that's because we haven't had visitors in over a year. But regardless, I wanna give them credit where credit's due. I hope that um, the questions that I ask in my testimony will be uh, gleaned out of the DOC. For years, they keep promising us in hearings to unhand data, but we never see anything at the tail end. It would be great to have some accountability, especially regarding answers that they promise us under oath. Thank you so much for listening. And I look forward to <clears throat> an ongoing, honest, and open exchange in the future, however naive that statement may seem. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Michelle Evans, followed by Donna Hilton, and then Dahlia Dean. Talk is ready. Let me unmute myself. Can you hear me? We hear okay. you. I'm Michelle Evans, and I was incarcerated in Rikers from the beginning of July of January 2019 until June of 2020. Um, what I experienced there won't leave me. It's not something that can leave a person. I want to start with the simple little things because it makes no sense. These aren't taken care of. There's cockroaches all throughout the place. I worked in the mess hall and my job was to kill cockroaches constantly. Um, that, that's just not acceptable. Rats, there are rats. Um, the place is filthy. I, I really wanna bring up the Supreme Court in Manhattan holding cells is extremely small. Um, they stuff about six of us in there with uh, a, a cell that's maybe the size for two. And we have to lay down on the floor and um, I had to lay down on the floor next to somebody who made me very uncomfortable. Um, and you, you shouldn't have to have your body um, just pushed up to somebody else's body unwillingly. And, and that's what's happening in, in those cases. Um, 
that's a big problem. The um, ACS won't allow women to have their children in the maternity ward. Like I said, I worked in the mess hall, so I delivered food. And I know that in that year and a half that I was there, I can count on my hand, on my one hand, the number of times I delivered a meal to that in maternity ward. Um, they're just not letting them bring their babies. Um, there's a problem with reporting anything to the police. Once you're in Rikers, they, there is absolutely no way for you to file a police report. Many women are in there because of domestic abuse and their survival is criminalized and they are not given an opportunity to have both sides held responsible for what's going on. Um, that, that was appalling to me. Um, it looks like I'm out of time, but um, uh, I did, I'm wearing a coat from the boutique and I, I would like to congratulate them for, for that program because the boutique is nice and um, there's a lot of room for us to improve there. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Donna Hilton, followed by Dahlia Teen, and then Kristen Edwards. Clock is ready. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for um, uh, hearing us today. I um, want to start by saying my name is Donna Hilton. I'm the founder and president of A Little Piece of Light. We are a 501c3 woman-led organization, and we are all formerly incarcerated, directly impacted women. Our focus are women and girls, uh, trans women and gender fluid individuals who've been impacted by abuse, trauma, violence, uh, and incarceration, and not necessarily in that order. We focus on policy and legislations, campaigns. Uh, we have some uh, support services. One of the things that we're pushing hard and we will be starting soon is housing because it continues to be a, 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 a very important uh, necessity, unfortunately, for women, and especially trans women. Um, we do not have enough housing, so thankfully my partners here, uh, WCJA, I see Providence House and stuff, but we still don't have enough. So I just wanna put that clearly out there for the council, because I've been beating it on some of you all to get support as well with this issue, because we can't talk about alternatives and getting women off of the island if we don't have the things that they need as uh, we've been hearing. And I just wanna say 36 years ago this month, I was detained on Rikers Island as an adolescent and I was placed in uh, protective custody, commonly known as solitary confinement. While there for six months, there was a female captain who uh, I guess was showing a lot of favoritism towards me uh, and would visit me a lot and come talk to me, whatever. And one day I went to court, mind you, I was an adolescent in protective custody never been arrested, never had any involvement with the system. I went to court one day and I came back and I came back and I was told that uh, I was um, in trouble. I didn't know what that trouble was. What I found out was that someone somehow had put a shank under my bed or in my bed, I don't even know, I never saw it. And I was in trouble for it because it was mine. So I found out after going through this was that the, the female captain that was uh, coming down the protective custody, solitary confinement to see me and talk to me had a partner, a female captain who was just turning, she had just been promoted to uh, be a de deputy. So I found out that it was this deputy who had my room searched and all of a sudden, and, and whoever else, I, there was a shank in my room. I never could go anywhere, do anything. I was in, so I was in solitary confinement. But I got in trouble for something that was placed in my room, a weapon that I asked that I was smart enough to understand because people talk and they were telling me what to do to say, produce this so I can see it. And then I wanted fingerprints tested because I know I've never, I've, I've, I didn't even have a book in that room. So there was no way that I had something like that. I've never, I never saw anything like that. And I was an adolescent at this time. So when I heard testimony from docs today and others, what amazed me was nothing has changed. The only thing has changed is how they, they, they um, acknowledge things and how they, they term things, right? Yesterday I said the same thing, vocabularies, all that's changed. Absolutely nothing has changed. 
What I continue uh, to hear are lies. We are not involved in any part of this. None of us that have been impacted, none of us that are doing this work, our friends, families of impacted people, I don't see us where we are in this conversation doing any of the work that's necessary. There was a PREA Act that was created. I don't understand how the state has a better way of running it than DOCS has a way of doing it. I mean, that doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense to me how we don't ask people who have this lived experience for um, you know, their knowledge and their, and their expertise, right? I don't understand that. We continue, to, we continue to look outside to others to do this work. We have some trained professionals here. We have WCJA, we have um, Dr. Victoria Phillips who focuses on mental health. We have Providence House, we have a little piece of light. We have so many, so many, but we, we fail to utilize what we have and look at us, they look at us like we don't know what we're doing. We created organizations, we creating work, we created legislation to decarcerate and to shut that island down. We can get those women off and put them in the programs and the spaces that are necessary and that they need, but we continue to hear this, this rhetoric. I've been doing this work since I've been out for nine years and I was doing it inside. And I'm hearing the same thing over and over and over again. I don't know why we continue to have hearings. Nothing has changed and you calling it yourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rosenthal for calling that out. Let's be clear in what we're hearing. We know that it's not true. 98% of what they're saying is not true. We have trans women on that island. We have women on that island. We have young women on that island and we know what's going on. We know what's not going on. Their response to mental health is absurd. It's absurd and archaic. We should not be locking people up, detained or whatever, putting them in cages to respond to the needs that they have. Poverty is violence. That's why we have the vast majority of people in these spaces detained or incarcerated because of poverty. Let's be clear, utilize the money. I keep hearing where we want, they want money to, to, uh, to fix up, right? To fix up Rose M. Singer. They need money so they can do, uh, create better mental health. That's nonsense. That's nonsense. Hey, thanks, Ms. Hilton. We, we want to make sure we can get to the other panel as well. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Dahlia Teen, followed by Kristen Edwards, followed by Elise Benusa. Clock is ready. Hi, yes. My name is Dahlia Teen. I'm from the Osborne Association. Thank you for the opportunity to be able to present today. I am part of the program, the Visiting and Family Assistant Program that DOC has mentioned, and I run the video visiting program for Osborne. We want to draw attention not just to the women who are currently incarcerated at Rosie, but for the thousands of women in the community that are affected by this. Though we know that many women are... That your audio is breaking up a lot. Maybe if you cut off your video, maybe we'll hear you better. It's mostly women that are making up the visiting on the We're, island. Uh, sorry, over a yeah. year since they have been able to come into a visit. DOCS has been able to open up state visiting. They've been transparent about that plan, but we're not receiving that from DOC. DOC is seeing that they're... Sure, can I use my cell phone? Because I'm on my cell phone now. Is there a way to unmute me? You can just pause the clock maybe for a second, and I think she wants to switch over to uh, the phone. There, I think she's... You can continue. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, we can't hear you, so let's. Um, okay, I'm unmuted now. I apologize. Okay, you have 40 seconds left. Okay, so again, we're just looking for in-person visiting to begin again and for a plan around that. We're ready to get that started and the families really need it. We'd like them to rethink how they open up visiting. 500 people a day, that was way too much. Families are going through 
four or five different checkpoints and it's very difficult to be able to connect with your families. We give credit to DOC for starting televisiting. We appreciate that, but I've used the system myself and it's extremely difficult to use. You do not get scheduled. You do not hear back. You get the wrong days and times. It doesn't work for anybody. And it's really hard for most families to be able to navigate the system online and it's just not working. So we lastly also like to ask that video equipment and phones be used for proper discharge planning. Osborne and many other providers are ready to do pre-release discharge planning, and we just need the ability to do so, and we're hoping that DOC will allow this. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Kristen Edwards, followed by Elise Benusa, and then Eileen Marr. Clock is ready. Good afternoon. My name is Kristen Edwards and I'm the program director of the Women's Community Justice Project. Thank you to Chairperson Diaz, Chairperson Powers and both committees for the opportunity to present testimony today and for your and Councilmember Rosenthal's important questions. WCJP provides supportive transitional housing to women and gender expansive people as an alternative to detention. The majority of the people we support are survivors of violence and trauma, their mothers, they're women of color, they're low income and homeless. Their incarceration not only replicates the abuse and violence they survived, it exacerbates their trauma. Our jails are not the place for the support and care needed to heal from pain. We have seen the WCJP and many other community organizations can be. While addressing the poor conditions in jails is vitally important, this hearing fails to acknowledge that the Rose M. Singer Center can and should be closed much sooner, 2027. With a current population of 270 and community organizations ready and willing to provide support right now, we have an opportunity to put an end to this misery. Since the fall of 2020, we've been waiting for Mock J to release an RFP for transitional housing to reduce the use of incarceration and costly stays in city jails. As the RFP release gets pushed back every two weeks, we grow increasingly frustrated learning how the city is spending to keep money to keep spending money to keep people incarcerated. Specifically, the $107 million allocated to renovate Rosie's while occupancy in the building is at about 33%. And the more than $447,000 spent for each person in a city jail in fiscal year 20, a 30% increase over the previous year. We also urge the council to consider a law like the one recently passed in Minnesota that permits the release of pregnant and postpartum people into community-based programming. WCJP has expertise in working with pregnant and postpartum people coming from jail, and we could easily scale up to meet a greater need if provided the proper resources. Thank you to the committees for calling attention to troubling conditions but please look more closely by closing Rosie's now. Please don't wait until 2027. Thanks for your time and consideration. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Elise Benusa, followed by Eileen Marr and then Rita Zimmer. Mark is ready. Good afternoon, my name is Elise Benusa and I work at Planned Parenthood of Greater New York for the government relations team. I would like to thank the Committee on Women and Gender Equity and the Committee on Criminal Justice Reform for holding this important hearing to discuss the experiences of women while incarcerated. PPGNY is proud to submit testimony in support of Introduction 1209, Introduction 1491, and Introduction 1646. PPGNY supports Introduction 1209, which would allow incarcerated women access to doula services during delivery. Doulas give emotional and physical support to mothers during delivery and translate gynecological knowledge throughout their birthing journey. Every person has a right to give birth with dignity in a safe and supportive environment of their choosing. This bill will support the already incredible work of ancient song doula services who are giving prenatal care to incarcerated women. Currently, these services, currently these services provide prenatal consultation childbirth education, nutritional support, and pain management. This law would allow for doula support to carry into the delivery process, which is important for continuity of care. 
Having an advocate during delivery is especially imperative for women who are in Department of Corrections custody to ensure the needs of mothers are being met and acknowledged. Enacting more visibility into the delivery room will be beneficial for mothers who are experiencing childbirth under the traumatic and stressful conditions of incarceration. PPG and Y fully supports this amendment to create a safer space for mothers to deliver their babies. PPG and Y supports introduction 1491, which would require the Commissioner of Corrections to create a comprehensive training program to investigate sexual crimes. The training curriculum must be patient-centered, inclusive, trauma-informed, and culturally competent. The content should also include referral information on organizations that can provide affordable, quality medical and social services. It is, a, it is critical for investigators to build and sustain partnerships with these organizations in order to provide a holistic range of services for survivors. This program must be part of a comprehensive and coordinated community response to ensure that survivors are not further traumatized during the investigation and to reduce the risk of poor health outcomes that could potentially result from or worsen by violence. Lastly, I just want to say PBGNY recognizes the significance of increasing visibility into the operations at DOC and effort to shed light on the safety and health care of those in custody. We are thankful for this opportunity to advocate for women's health and we will continue to work with the committee to protect people's well-being within DOC. Thank you to the committee for all these important measures being taken, taken to increase access to reproductive health. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Eileen Marr, followed by Rita Zimmer, and then Helen Skipper. Talk is ready. Um, Eileen, we can't hear you. Did you accept the prompt to unmute? Oh, sorry about that. Um, good afternoon. Thank you for allowing me to speak. I'm a member of the Justice for Women Task Force and a survivor of Rosie's where I spent well over a year. And I'm here to tell you that New York City DOC as it stands today can no longer be trust entrusted to care for, the, care for and provide any services for the women who are detained. By the way, they are not inmates, they are detainees. While detained, I observed a DO staff that is poorly trained, poorly educated, spiteful, and physically, sexually, and medically abusive. Their ability to lie and scheme at will is unmatched. Therefore, I urge the city council to discount any statistics or planned policy and rule changes they have put forward today and of late. At Rosie's, I observed an established environment where officers and staff routinely abused and assaulted, including sexually, my sisters. These traumas were compounded by an absence of the appropriate medical and mental health services. I had to routinely call and write the Prisoner's Rights Project at the Legal Aid Society to receive adequate mental and medical health. This uh, services, this compounds the traumas experienced pre-incarceration, such as long-term abuse, poverty, poor health, drug and alcohol abuse, and as in my own situation, domestic violence. Then you have the, then you have the, uh, then they have the audacity to act surprised at the recidivism rates. And so all the women can be, and gender expansive women can be decarcerated. I believe that in order to remedy these inhumane conditions, New York City should adopt its own version of the Camden experiment. For DOC, yes, where all officers, employees, employment is terminated and the responsibility of care and custody of our mothers, daughters, and sisters is handed over to a, poor, a properly trained, educated, and vetted group of indi individuals. In addition, the closure, closure of Rosie's must be expedited via an increase in alternatives to incarceration, a massive infusion of community-based programs, and for the few that would be left, but hopefully none, transfer to a solo freestanding location off of Rikers Island. Thank you. Thank you. Just want to remind everyone that when it's your turn to speak, you will get a prompt to unmute. So make sure you accept it um, before you begin your testimony. Um, next, we're going to hear from Rita Zimmer, followed by Helen Skipper, and then Jordan Rosenthal. Clock is ready. Okay, good, good afternoon. And I want to say thank you to the women with lived experience who've been testifying. They're the ones who've got the courage today. I'm always nervous when I speak because I think it's important, but 
I'm just so impressed by them and we wanna hear more and more from them. My name is Rita Zimmer. I'm with the Women's Community Justice Project, which is part of Housing Plus. And I'm also with the Women's Community Justice Association. And we're an advocacy and a do, we do something. We do something every day. And I just as impressive that we're spending $450,000 to keep someone at Rikers. That's $36,000 a month. For $30,000 a year, we bring a woman out of Rikers, put her in transitional housing, help her find permanent housing, and help her get the services she needs. 80% of the women at Rikers are there detained. They have not been convicted. They are detained. They have their services and housing and dignity. Uh, we need, give us the money, I think is what the best thing I can say. Give us the money so we can close Rosie's down and open up the kind of programs women need. Uh, I just can't keep saying it anymore. Thirty, four hundred fifty thousand dollars It costs us $30,000. We're, show us the money, show us the money. We can close it down. We can do it this year. We can do it in 2021, 22. And let's hear more from the women with lived experience. Thank you so much. I'm so honored to be in the company of these women. They have taught me so much about dignity and courage and survival and success. I'm touched all the time by their dignity and their resilience and their courage. Thank you so much for letting me speak today. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Helen Skipper, followed by Jordan Rosenthal, and then Sharon White Hannigan. Harrigan. Thank you. I'm on. Hello. Can you hear me? So I'd like to say thank you for everyone who has shown up today and testified. I'm going to start off real short and sweet. I grew up on Rikers Island. I grew up in the Rosam Singer Center. I had my son through the Rosam Singer Center in 1988. While I appreciate what corrections are trying to do now, guess what? I was pregnant on the island and gave birth in 1988. We are now in 2021. Your solutions are coming 20, 30, 40 years too late. I also want to say I am affiliated with A Little Piece of Light. Donna Hilton also came up and described what A Little Piece of Light does. We need more supports. We need more positive supports for women. And the time that I went back and forth to Rikers Island from in the early 80s until I left out for the last time in 2007, I repeatedly came in addicted to drugs, left out addicted to drugs. I came in suffering in crisis from a mental health, left out the same way. I came in homeless, left out homeless. At the end of the day, we need to rebuild this system so that it's not punitive and it is more rehabilitative. I was repeatedly criminalized because I was addicted to drugs. So yes, I might've went into a drugstore and stole a bottle of lotion, but that was to feed my habit. Help me with the situation that is at hand. We criminalize mental illness, we criminalize substance abuse, we criminalize homelessness money that you are using to build up an infrastructure that is already broken and falling into the ground can be better used to support services for housing and transitional services for women coming home. Using the sequential intercept model, there are several places we can intercept someone going into the criminal justice system. That money can be used in all areas from community to courts to re-entry. Please do not spend any more of my money, my taxpayers' money, to rebuild something that needs to be trashed. We need to go out this different. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Jordan Rosenthal, followed by Sharon White Harrigan, and then Deborah Rigano. Clock is ready. Hi, my name is Jordan Rosenthal, and I'm the Director of Community Engagement at the Women's Community Justice Association. I wanted to first thank Chair Powers and Chair Diaz for holding this hearing and bringing attention to the horrendous conditions in which women and gender expansive people suffer in our city jails. First, I want to acknowledge the fact that the city's current plan to move women and gender expense, um, expansive people off of Rikers means that they will be last. The current plan will move women to a borough-based facility in Queens, but most women, specifically 33%, are charged in Manhattan, followed by Brooklyn with 19%, whereas Queens only represents 15%. 
If the city was actually committed to being guided by the principles of being centrally located near the courthouses and by public transit, the new women's borough-based facility would be in Manhattan, not Queens. And I strongly urge you to talk to your colleagues about that. Secondly, we need more data transparency as everyone had been saying before. Through the help of our partners, we've been able to receive a semi-public data set about every woman and gender expansive person on Rikers Island. And yet we've still been unable to see things like the definitive number of pregnant women. How do you not know how many pregnant women are in your custody? It's not that hard of a question. But we do know things like that there were 276 women in custody in mid-March and 19% were there for parole violations. 14% had a misdemeanors. 15% had cash bail below $10,000. 20% had cash bail below $20,000. And 25% had cash bail below $50,000. 24%, one fourth, were charged with property crimes. We are valuing people's property over people's lives. And 7% were charged with drug crimes. We could decarcerate a majority of these women and gender expansive people today if the city made more publicly available data. So advocates in the community on people's behalf, one by one. I urge the city of council to push Mach J to enter into a data agreement with the Women's Community Justice Association so we can work together to decarcerate women one by one. Thank you for your time and I look forward to working with you. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Sharon White Harrigan, followed by Deborah Regano, and then Danielle Minnelli Pagnotta. Clock is ready. All right. Thank you to the committee chair Powers and Diaz, and to all the members of both committees, and CM Rosenthal for bringing these very important issues to the forefront. My name is the Reverend Sharon White Harrigan. I am the executive director of the Women's Community Justice Association, also known as WCJA. I am a member of the Faith Communities for Just Reentry and a leader of the Justice for Women Task Force under WCJA. And I am most importantly, a survivor of Rikers Island and I am representing representing the 271 women currently on Rikers Island and all the other women who are unable to make it here today. In 2019, the decision was made to close Rikers Island because of the brutality, horrendous conditions, torture, lack of adequate care, violence, rape, toxicity, uh, zero respect, mortalities, lack of regard, corruption. Why are the women still there? There are over 80% that are mothers, over 89% Black and Latinos, and 100% that are traumatized. If the city is paying $445,000 a year for women to be detained, contained, and defamed, why are we not talking about a full decarceration plan to move the women out? Why are we not having a hearing to reallocate the money into the community and scale up and build out more alternatives to detention and incarceration? Why are we not getting the women reunified with families, healings, and wellness centers that addresses women's health, mental health, trauma, substance use issues, poverty, and homelessness. Why are we still locking up pregnant women and not diverting them to specialized services for women and children where they can get birthing coaches and doulas? Why are we not using the 445,000 to bail out every woman and provide them with a holistic plan to healing? Why are we not talking not about doctor. accountability? Why are we not talking about how the impoverished black and brown community Communities continue to be targeted, especially the women. Why is the city not acknowledging the part they continuously play in perpetuating violence and trauma against women every day that the women remain at Rikers Island? Again, why are we here and why are the women still there? Release the women off of Rikers Island, bring them into the community. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Deborah Regano, followed by Danielle Minnelli Pagnotta, and then Allison Wilkie. Hi, my name is Deborah Regano. Um, I'm, I'm here on behalf of our children, 
I'm the director of jails and prisons for the Our Children program. And um, I had to write it so. Um, just to say that um, we um, run in Bedford Hills, into, um, into kind of, uh, correctional facilities, we run the family services program there. And we run the family assistant program at the Rose Singer Center on Rikers. In addition, we have many community-based programs that include tra traditional tra transitional housing, a back to work program and supporting women on work release from Edgecombe Correctional Facility. We also have, a, have had a weekly presence in Rikers as advocates for over a decade. Um, we're, I'm gonna focus on three different things, the doula information and then um, the video visiting and in person and, and then Rikers uh, itself. So the dual information is that we've had many, many years of experience in the nursery in Bedford Hills. So we have a dual program there and um, and it's especially useful supplement to the existing right, and it can be an especially useful supplement to the existing Rikers nursery program. Um, Dulas are associated with much higher rates of breastfeeding, which is important to short and long-term health of baby and mother. In infants, rates of upper respiratory and other infections go way down the first year of life when breastfeeding is present. When postpartum doulas are present, rates of postpartum physical and emotional complications go down because they are aware of and looking for signs of medical and emotional distress in the days and weeks that follow the birth. When a mother has the support of a doula postpartum, rates of postpartum mood, mood disorders either go down or are addressed quickly. Women have the choice to receive doula services that are incredibly important for the women's well being, and they are happier and calmer when they have that necessary support. As far as the vi video visits, um, according to the Vera Institute for Justice, research shows that prison visits are vital to the success of incarcerated people, reducing reoffending, facilitating reentry into the community, and promoting positive parent child relationships. Video visits fill the gap and complement in person visits but do not replace them. Can I, I'm, I'm done, no? Our children passionately believes there is no substitution for in-person visiting when it comes to children visiting their parents. The vision, vis, video visit scheduling days were not conducive to many of the families with school-aged children or working guardians. Um, there's certain, certainly some uh, things that need to be reconsidered as times and uh, when most children are in school. Um, also, a lot of uh, we've heard that a lot of the uh, people don't have Wi-Fi. So, um, just kind of giving the current system a, a, a rehab or whatever that needs to be done, so that more people can see their their uh, children. Um, as to the issue of separate jails to replace Rikers, we agree much that is in the uh, MOCJ plan and believe smaller jails, carefully designed and humanly ad administrated, will lead to correcting many of the ills of Rikers. If we are serious about the goal of helping women return to their families and community possessing better life skills than they exhibited before, we need a site where programs and policies are designed for women and not simply a lesser version of a male facility. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Danielle Manelli Pagnotta, followed by Allison Wilkie and then Noah Watford. Bach is ready. Good afternoon. Thanks to Chairs Diaz and Powers and the members of the committee for holding this hearing and inviting public testimony. Thanks also to Councilmember Rosenthal for your questioning earlier today. I'm Danielle Manelli Pagnata and I'm the Executive Director of Providence House, a nonprofit founded in Brooklyn over 40 years ago, now serving more than 400 women and families impacted by homelessness, mental health issues, justice involvement at our nine transitional and permanent residences throughout the borough. We're proud to share this work with other organizations as a part of the Women's Community Justice Association and the Beyond Rosie's campaign. I'm also speaking as a New York native and a resident of Queens. And in all of these capacities, I feel that closing Rikers Island, in particular Rosie's, should remain among the cities and the city council's very top priorities until every person is off that island. There's no call to waste two minutes recounting the well-known reasons for closing Rikers. The events of the past year have done more to only highlight the horrible conditions for New Yorkers held there and further shown the moral imperative to immediately change the way justice is perceived and pursued. Simply, there's unnecessary suffering, lives ruined for no reasons, and an outrageous injustice going on every day here in this city. 
near the top of the Articles of Agreement that the city adopted in October 2019 was a resolve to increase ATI funding. I encourage you all to create and sustain as much urgency around that priority as you can. Providence House, along with other fine organizations represented here, are currently operating residences that serve as alternatives to the dehumanizing and unsafe confinement at Rikers. There are solutions that keep women in the community, connect them with services to address mental health issues and other needs, support them in developing healthy relationships and more productive patterns in their lives. And more importantly, avoids further trauma, isolation and alienation. This is especially important for programs like the one that we run at Providence House, which reunites women with their children and prevents the trauma from rolling into other generations. These are excellent alternatives to Rikers, and I would urge the committees to work with Mock J to release the RFP that was previously referenced for transitional housing. We all stand together, ready to respond to the RFP and provide more transitional and permanent housing resources in the community that lead to more decarceration, to closing Rikers, and most importantly, closing Rosie's right away. Thanks for all of you and for your time today. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Allison Wilkie, followed by Noah Watford, and then Minister Dr. Victoria Phillips. Clock's ready. Good afternoon. My name is Allison Wilkie, and I'm the Director of Public Policy at the John Jay College Institute for Justice and Opportunity. In 2017, we issued a report on women incarcerated in New York City. Unfortunately, many of the findings of that report are as relevant today as they were four years ago, as others have testified. While the number of women has dropped since we issued that report, there remains much to do, but with the right policy changes and investments, it is absolutely feasible for New York City to come close to eliminating the incarceration of women. We heard the data from WCJA, it is absolutely possible for us to decarcerate Rosie's and end and the incarceration and the harm that comes to women. But to do this, the city must address the housing needs of those impacted by the criminal legal system. Upon admission to Rikers, 21% of women identified as being homeless or having unstable housing. And 32% identified as being homeless or having unstable housing upon release from Rikers. Overall, formerly incarcerated women are more likely to be homeless than formerly incarcerated men, and this is a racial justice issue. Black women experience the highest rates of sheltered homelessness, nearly four times the rate of white men and twice as high as the rate for black men. Lack of access to housing is relevant to reducing incarceration at Rikers in two ways. First, when people are released from jail, lack of stable housing makes it difficult for people to reconstruct their lives and achieve economic stability and care for their families. And too often, this puts people in the precarious position of trying to meet basic survival needs. Second, many alternatives to incarceration and treatment programs are difficult to access and complete successfully without a stable home. As uh, Dana Kaplan from Mokji said earlier, the hotels are at capacity. And as Chair Diaz very personally talked about, transitional housing isn't permanent housing, although those programs are doing amazing work. But the City Council can take a tremendous step to addressing the needs of formerly incarcerated people by passing intro 2047, the Fair Chance for Housing Act. The bill would eliminate the use of conviction records and housing and increase access for the 117,000 New York City women who have a conviction. The passage of the bill would increase access to housing, help women exiting Rikers, all without cost to the city, all without having to build new housing, and all without having to wait for RFPs. The city administration supports intro 2047 and the city council needs to act now and vote on it at the next dated meeting so that we can continue to decarcerate Rikers and achieve justice for women. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Noah Watford followed by Minister Dr. Victoria Phillips followed by Sister Eli. Clock is ready. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hello? All right, yes. I, I have bad service, I apologize. So on behalf of Youth Justice Network, formerly known as Friends Island Academy, I thank the Committee on Criminal Justice and the Committee on Women and Gender Equity for the opportunity to address you. 
My name is Noah Watford. I'm a senior youth advocate at Youth Justice Network, serving young women, trans people, and gender non-binary people aged 18 to 24 at Rosen Singer Center. I met Marissa when she was around four months pregnant and incarcerated at Rosie's in the pregnancy ward. She was in good spirits and throughout her pregnancy, despite the stress of her trial and impending court dates, made an effort to engage with programming, her advocate, and was planning for her child and her future. As her due date approached, my colleague and director of the McKeeva Project, Michelle Cardona, and I walked her through the process of childbirth. She would be driven to the hospital, only given a few moments with her baby, and then her baby would be taken away. Her due date approached, and as expected, she was taken to the hospital for 24 hours to have her baby. When we next saw her, she was a shell of the person we had last spoken to. The correctional officers on duty informed us that she had come back from the hospital and had been in her bunk for seven days without showering or eating. When we finally spoke to her, she told us, I held my baby for only a few minutes. Then they took him away, gave me a pad, and told me to get ready to go back to Rosie's. Nobody asked if I was okay. Nobody told me how I could see my baby again. Throughout my years of working inside of Rosie's, I've heard firsthand about the young women, about the isolation and the trauma they face on a daily basis, cruelty at the hands of the correctional officers. Being pregnant and giving birth in jail is an extremely traumatic, isolating experience. This have shown that the separation is incredibly harmful for both mothers and children. For babies, separation from a mother at birth can lead to multiple severe emotional and behavioral problems later. For mothers, it can also be psychologically traumatizing and has been shown to increase risk of recidivism. Rikers Island actually has a nursery facility where women can nurse their babies for up to a year. Women must apply for this privilege, and according to DOC documentation, in the last five years, 26 women have applied for the nursery, 11 applications have been approved, and only five children have been admitted to the to nursery. I personally haven't witnessed any young women using a nursery. None of my participants have reported to using the nursery as well. Time Additionally, advocacy and support services lead up to... Thank you. Next, we will hear from Minister Dr. Victoria Phillips, followed by Sister Eli, followed by Zoe L. Phil. Talk is ready. Peace and blessings. Can you hear me? We hear you. Okay. Um, my name is Peace and Blessings. I'm Minister Dr. Victoria Phillips. Everyone calls me Ms. V. Excuse me if I talk fast. I'm, I have brain surgery, and I know y'all don't give time for people with visible disabilities. There, I'm not, I don't have a, uh, a speech. I want to hit on some bullet points. Um, first and foremost, I want to say this is 2021. Why doesn't city council still have a hotline for the, the, the incarcerated individuals to call in to give you their own testimony? I've asked that several times on the record. Second, when, when, when city council hears from the public, I think it's really important that you put us first so that you can ask DOC questions in real time and get real answers and responses. It's, it's hard that you make us go last. Um, third, I would like to say that the, um, you mentioned earlier Commissioner Brand and one of the bills, I support all the bills, but you mentioned earlier Commissioner Brand um, support um, developing a training or a plan. Don't ask Commissioner Brand to develop anything. And her entire time here, she has shown no leadership. The Federal Monitor Report has given 10 reports of lack of leadership and lack of accountability. This council needs to take a stand against it and make it change, right? Um, so also, I want to say she has also testified to this council that her most um, dangerous population was the young adults. I've sat on the advisory board for the Department of Corrections, Adolescents, and Young Adults for, since its beginning for six years. The entire time of COVID, they have not had us meet. Before COVID started, um, AC Torres said that she wanted to discontinue, but she wouldn't discontinue the group because she know I will run to city council. So hold them accountable. Um, fourth, I want to say, when we talk about the city council, human rights should be here, finance should be here, women and gender, health care, all of your committees are responsible for the people in DOC custody. And so often I see DOC lie to the Board of Corrections and the very next day they'll come and tell city council something different. Enough of that. Have your staff attend these meetings. I, even if I miss the meeting, I listen to the meeting while I'm cleaning my house. There is no excuse any longer for you not to be aware of the things that DOC is saying in, in, in the capacity of, of your constituents. And I also want to say investigations, I, I advocated for monies to be for that investigating youth and to, to actually occur. Hold them accountable. They, they give you riddles with the data, the numbers don't match, and BOC does their own reports and it doesn't even match what investigators RCHS hands you. 
hold them all accountable. There's no PPE still, no cleaning supplies. Um, and 53% of people incarcerated have a mental health concern. Mental health should be coming around more than every 28 days. And you should not have to be placed on a mental health or I do Brad H monitoring as well. You should not have to be a part of Brad H to be to, to be given mental health services. If you request it, it should be given because that's your human right. And I'll end there. Peace and blessings. I want to talk to the chair, please. I want to talk to you on the side. Councilman Rosenthal, I want to talk to you because I have so much wealth of information. Thank you, thank you, thank you for using my questions today. Because for over 10 years, I've been coming to the city council. And, and a lot of y'all ignore the things I say on the record. And it does not make sense because lives are on the line. And this, y'all all have an accountability that we all have to do our part. Thank you so much. Peace and blessings. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Sister Eli, followed by Zoe Phil, and then Cecily McMillan. Clock is ready. Good morning, kings and queens. My name is Sister Eli. I'm a graduate of Women's Prison Association Leadership and Media Project and a member of the Justice for Women COVID-19 Task Force. Did you know that I had to seek these pro programs out for myself? No referrals were made by New York City Probation to assist me and my child be successful in the community. Over 90% of women are gender and gender expensive people are detained on Rikers or held at Rose M. Senior. In mid-March of 2021, 19% were for parole violations. In mid-November of 2020, 23% have been diagnosed with a serious mental health illness like my mother who was suffering from grief and my father dying and a psychotic break. One night she was pushed by a Greek male whom she pushed back. They began tussling and when the police arrived, only she was arrested and charged with a felony. She was away from her family, unable to pay rent, unable to participate in her defense and unable to, to participate in community programs for several months. While detained, she refused to shower because another woman with mental illness often defecated in the showers. She witnessed correction staff being disrespectful and unprofessional in the way they spoke and had inappropriate relationships with people detained that they have power and control over. Yet the woman and gender expansive people are expected to respect each other and staff. In past reports, 60% of sexual assaults were against officers. Why are we not complying to PREA? There is no such thing as consent when you are in DOC custody. With these and many other issues being reiterated today, it makes logical and fiscal sense for Rosen Singer to be the next Rikers location to close. We don't need a smaller location in Queens County because a majority of open cases are in Manhattan. We need investments in our community and alternatives to incarceration because women are ensnared in the system due to poverty, drug addiction, mental illness, sexual assault, and criminalized for surviving. That's we fine. need programs to address these needs. We deserve stability. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Zoe Thill, followed by Cecily McMillan. Clock is ready. Hi, can everyone hear me? We can hear you. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Dr. Zoe Phil. I was for a short time a physician in the city jails, but before that I was a primary care doctor in the Bronx. I took care of families with missing members and I saw how incarceration complicated decisions about childcare and schooling as many folks have already described. I took care of folks who had been incarcerated and saw how their struggles to get good jobs or housing afterwards impacted their families, community, health. Jail is disruptive and I always knew that, but once I became a jail doctor and saw with my own eyes the inhumanity of the place, I became absolutely committed to ending the institution. I will comment today and submit written, written testimony onto the intro um, 1209 related to doulas and midwives. But let me first underscore that taking better care of people inside cannot be our ultimate goal. As many have said, we need to get people home back to our families and our communities and we need to close right, right, uh, Rosie's and all the jails. Um, doulas and midwives are essential advocates for pregnant birthing people. Having a doula is associated with improved birth outcomes, including reductions in low birth weight babies and fewer maternal and infant complications. For people in custody, having a doula in the room during labor and delivery will mean having an additional advocate. I've heard from colleagues in labor and delivery rooms from across, across this city that patients continue to be shackled in labor 
even despite policies prohibiting that practice. Patients don't always know their rights, but a trained doula will. And to that end, I believe the language in 12, 1209 allowing DOC to override a patient's right to a doula or midwife should be removed from the bill entirely. Um, as someone who recently pushed a baby out of my vagina and can therefore attest to the all-consuming nature of the birthing experience, I assure you, there is absolutely no birthing person that is a security risk. Um, thank you for holding this meeting and thank you for allowing me an opportunity to testify. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Cecily McMillan. Clock is ready. Hi, I am Cecily McMillan and I am a survivor of Rikers and I am appalled. It has been five years since I've attended one of these meetings. It has been nearly seven years since I was released from Rikers. I have um, written a book published by Hachette through Nation Books and yet, Everything we're talking about today is covered in six different notebooks. And I can't believe that we're still talking about the things that I risked my life to, to talk about in the media, to talk that I got kicked out of New York for because the corrections officer said you can leave or see what happens. I can't believe that I came out and I talked about the stillborn fetus that I watch get born in a waiting cell. I can't imagine that I'm still sitting here talking to y'all about this when the only time in the whole of my Rikers existence that women talked about responding violently ever was that a woman was being shackled. And even I as a nonviolent activist had to say, I'm not gonna stand against the women of Rikers. I'm not gonna stand for this. I can't believe that we're still talking about sexual misconduct after I came up and talked about to, to some of these members here, the woman who had to hold semen in her mouth as a sample in order to report on the two guards. I cannot believe that I lost my entire life there, that I am now at my first house, getting my first lease, seven years it took me. I have my PhD work completed. I have actually read all of these books, but it took me seven years years to get this lease and I have to move out because of mold poisoning and I'm going to go back into homelessness and I cannot believe that I risked all of this to sit here and have this conversation again seven years later. Please, for the love of God, make some changes. Get these women out of prison. Let these babies be born. My best friend in Jim is writing a book called Rosie's Babies because of all of the women who were born in Rikers and continued to return. How is this still a thing? Please. Thank you. Thank you. This concludes the public testimony. If we have in inadvertently forgotten to call on someone to testify, if that person please raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand function, we will hear from you now. Okay. Seeing no hands, I will turn it over to Chair Powers to close the hearing. Thank you everyone for sticking with us and testifying and sharing your own personal stories as well as adding in um, uh, a voice to uh, issues that are desperately needed. I want to thank Chair Diaz and also Chair uh, Councilman Rosenthal for their uh, uh, questioning, their thoughtfulness, and their, of course, uh, advocacy here and Councilman Rosenthal for her legislation as well. Um, before I close it out, I want to just see if uh, Chair Diaz, if you had any uh, closing comments. I, I just, I want to thank you all that testified today. Again, I, what I bring to the council is my life experience. The last person that spoke brought me to me being at St. Mary's Hospital, 19 years old. I was ready to give birth and, the, and they weren't listening to me. They just thought I was being over emotional and didn't know what my body was experiencing. I screamed until I got attention. A few minutes later, my daughter was born. So again, I, I'm sorry for your hardship. As a woman, I, I get it. I understand it. Giving birth to you, uh, it's hard. It, it's hard as is. And being shackled, it's, it's Human rights. And any closing, if I may, my understanding is 
And there's conversation about being able to choose who's touching your body, whether a male or a female. That should also be considered human right. So I will be getting together with my colleagues and supporting that bill. Thank you for the opportunity to have closing comments. Enough is enough. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, sorry, we have one more person who's here to testify, uh, Susan Shaw. Hi, Susan. Okay, go ahead. Clock is ready. Hello. Sorry about that before. Um, good afternoon, Chair Powers, Chair Diaz, and members of the Committees on Criminal Justice and Women and Gender e Equity. My name is Susan Shaw, and I'm a Managing Director for Racial Justice at Trinity Church Wall Street. Trinity is an active Episcopal church just down the street from City Hall with more than 1,600 parishioners. In addition to our ministry, we have an established grants program that provides more than 20 million in annual grant funding to New York City organizations that are working to end the cycles of incarceration and homelessness. We are proud to support a number of the New York City organizations that are proving the potential for combining housing with reentry services for justice involved women and families. Last year, early in the pandemic, Trinity Church helped to form Faith Communities for Just Reentry, which is a coalition of over 40 faith leaders from across the city that seek to address the urgent needs of those being released from jail and ensure they are safe and set up to succeed in the community. As everyone has said today, New York City's jails have failed women. The city must do more to protect the well being of incarcerated women in all of the city jails. Trinity recommends that the city implement the following five measures to protect the well being of incarcerated women and others leaving city jails. I will just list these recommendations now, and you can find additional detail in my written testimony. First, we must issue IDNYC cards to everyone upon release from city jails so they can access housing, healthcare, employment, and other um, vital services. Second, we need to ensure that individuals released from jail have immediate access to Medicaid coverage upon discharge. Third, we must ban housing discrimination on the basis of arrest or criminal record and increase the value of city financed housing vouchers. We ask that the city council quickly pass both intro 146 and 2047. Fourth, we ask that you provide um, everyone uh, in jail with access to the COVID-19 vaccine as well as COVID testing. And finally, that you develop a coordinated re-entry system to guarantee the safety and success of everyone when they return to the community from jail. Thank you very much for providing me with this opportunity to testify. Thank you, Susan. Very good closing argument there for all of us, but uh, no, undoubtedly we have work to do the Fair Chance Housing Act, which you mentioned I'm a sponsor of and introduced with Council 11, the uh, increasing the city FEPS voucher, other things when we talk about reentry, which is uh, only one part of the equation, but certainly a big part of making sure that we create stability here. And uh, I want to thank Trinity for your work and our partnership in terms of focusing on the reentry work, because I, I, I'm including the IDNYC aspect of that, which is just a simple measure we've been pushing for to, uh, 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 make it a little bit easier for people to restart their lives. So um, thank you for that. And thank you for your testimony. And with that, we are going to close out the hearing. Thank you to everybody. Our staff will be reviewing testimony, looking at this legislation, taking feedback, and of course, going back to the Department of Corrections with uh, our uh, follow-up need for information and data. So if you want to reach any of us, you can email us and reach out to us. Thank you to council members who stuck with us and asked questions. Thank you to everyone for your patience uh, through a long hearing, but thanks everyone. And please get vaccinated and continue to wear a mask and be safe and healthy. We'll see you soon. Thanks so much. Speak Gavilan.